So we'll now start with uh, presentations from panel three. And on my list, Amy Bachman is first. Okay. Uh, my name is Amy Bachman. Um, I do have a PhD in toxicology, although it doesn't have my credentials in here. But um, we do have a good panel this afternoon, I think, um, representing ExxonMobil and ECPI. Um, I wanted to start out with just a couple comments before I got into my presentation, just to point out a few things for everyone. Um, ExxonMobil has provided extensive written comments. Um, and I believe it's on a CD that will be provided to all of you if you don't have it already. Um, there's quite a number of documents in there. The main document does attempt to address all 12 of the questions that are posed to the CHAP. Um, and there's plenty of supplemental data that are provided in there. Um, I'm not going to go through the full list of comments, but if you do have any questions on all the attachments that are included, please do let us know. Um, so I'm going to start out with kind of a general overview of DINP and DIDP points of interest that may not be covered or may have been covered already or presentations to come. Um, and then I'll be followed by Nina Hallmark, who's representing ECPI today on a presentation on endocrine disruption. She will be followed by Alan Godwin, who's also from ExxonMobil, um, talking about uses and the various phthalates. Okay. So my outline then includes just a, a brief uh, point on phthalate chemistry, the hazard characterization comparison that we've set up. Um, and just a little bit on cumulative risk, I just want to make a, a brief point about that, although you'll be hearing more about that later this afternoon through ACC presentation, presentations. The phthalates do constitute a broad class of chemicals with a range of physical, chemical, and toxicological properties. The properties are structure dependent. And what's very important and to be very clear is that phthalates are not all the same and they are not all toxicologically equivalent. So in previous presentations today, you hear the broad use of phthalate being thrown around. I think that term needs to be very clearly defined because all of these phthalates are not created equal. Um, phthalates are widely used because they have technical properties suitable to many applications, uh, but suitability is related to specific technical properties. Phthalates are sometimes interchangeable. You can hear more about that from Alan. I'm not going to go into that. But that interchange is not always appropriate for all uses. Um, Non-phthalate alternatives do exist, which you've heard about already. But some are not always as technically suitable or well characterized toxicologically or readily available or cost competitive. So to put this in kind of an overall table, um, calling this the overall hazard characterization. So we're looking at all the major um, endpoints for R2 phthalates, DINP, and DIDP in comparison with some of the uh, alternatives that you've already heard today. I'm not going to talk about the alternatives. The data that's presented is data that we were able to obtain from publicly available sources at this point. My focus is on DINP and DIDP. And the comparison table up here is just to show that DINP and DIDP have low toxicity, which is on par with most like the most likely alternatives. Um, so when people are talking about how safe these alternatives are, I think safe is not the, perfect, the appropriate scientific term to be thinking about. Safety has connotations of risk and all of that. When you're looking at toxicity, to compare the toxicity across our phthalates and alternatives, you'll see that they're pretty much on par. Um, I'm not going to talk about repeated dose, which is highlighted in yellow. I think that you'll get comments on the liver and kidney effects for DINP and DIDP in other presentations and probably tomorrow in your discussions with experts. Um, I'm going to focus on developmental just to point out what's been seen for DINP and DIDP. So for DINP, minimal developmental effects are thought to be due to maternal toxicity observed in the standard assays. Currently, they're not classified under the EU classification labeling, packaging, regulation, and UN globally harmonized system, it's GHS. So for DINP, the three main studies, developmental studies that you see are listed at the top, the references for each of those. Um, and I want to make a note that for any study that you see that is ours, ExxonMobil is willing to provide the full study report if need be, which I believe in the past we have done. So you can have the full 1,000-page document if you choose. Um, the critical effect that are seen, specifically in the Waterman and the Helwig study, skeletal variations um, are the main effect that's noted. Um, this is 
seen to really be due to the maternal, maternal, the dams are being um, toxic. I'll start over. Um, the dams are considered to be toxic at those doses, and so therefore any developmental effects are related to those uh, effects, which you see as reduced weight gain and food consumption. Um, the fetal NOAL is seen to be 1,500 and 200 across those studies, but you see the effect level is at 1,000 for each of the two studies that are showing effects, and that's just based on the dosing that you see the uh, NOAL to be different. For DIDP, um, there are two studies. Again, you see the same types of developmental effects uh, for DIDP, and again, um, the same concept applies here. The effect level you're seeing it is at 1,000. Um, your NOAL based on dose spacing is 500 and 200. Physical and chemical properties and exposure, DIDP and DINP are liquids with very low vapor pressure, water solubility, and dermal absorption. And again, I think Alan's going to speak to the first two of those. A point to be made, exposure is sufficiently high enough to induce adverse effects in humans are not plausible given the inherent phys chem properties of DIDP and DINP. And I think that Alan again will speak to that point. Just a note on exposure then, just as a visual to, to take a look at this, if you plot um, the 95th percentile of DINP exposure estimated from all sources, uh, you see how low they are in comparison to what's in blue, which is the ADI, which is 120 micrograms per kilogram. That's the CPSC ADI. Um, in comparison to that, the doses which induce effects in rats are up, you know, four to five orders above where you're seeing uh, exposures. And in that red box, you see the liver effects, the no AL for the liver effects, a low AL for developmental effects is the middle <laughs> dot, and the no AL for reproductive effects. So I think it, it speaks to how low the exposures are, specifically for DINP in relation to the ADI and where you're seeing effects in, in animals. In comparison to low molecular weight phthalates, this speaks to the fact that, again, as I started out with, not all phthalates are toxicologically equivalent, and I'd like to point out a couple of uh, differences between the two groups. Um, so if you group the low molecular weight phthalates into BBP, DBP, and DEHP, and high molecular weight being DINP and DIDP, you can see as you look down the list, and it is a one-to-one -one comparison across there, so we've listed them out um, together as you go down the list, you do see a number of effects with the low molecular weight phthalates, and in the green box you'll see for DINP and DIDP that those differences exist. So you don't see any reduction in anogenital distance with the high molecular weight phthalates, no nipple retention, no hypospadias, no cryptorchidism, no sex organ weight decrease, no adverse testis histopathology, and no decreases in fertility. Um, we do have a couple of footnotes to uh, draw your attention to for nipple retention and adverse testes histopath as there have been reports, um, well, at least one single report, Gray et al., for those two endpoints for your consideration. But importantly, they're not classified for reproductive and developmental effects um, as the low molecular weights are in the EU. So the NTP CERHR review has also concluded for DINP that there's minimal concern for adverse reproductive or developmental effects, and for DIDP, negligible concern for adverse reproductive uh, effects, and minimal concern for adverse developmental effects. So these phthalates have been extensively reviewed, and the conclusions have been um, similar to those that are uh, posed up there for CERHR. DIMP and DIDP are not selective, reproductive, or developmental toxins. DIMP and DIDP are not endocrine disruptors, and uh, Nina Hallmark will be speaking on the endocrine disruption endpoint, um, so you'll get a full 15 minutes on that. DIMP and DIDP do not pose a risk to male reproductive de tract development. Okay, and a note on cumulative risk. Um, so the main point of this is not to extensively look at what other people have done for cumulative risk or even to analyze, you know, how they've conducted that cumulative risk. Um, these are two that have been published. Um, Dr. Kortenkamp, I'm sure you're very familiar with your own data, um, and I don't want to misrepresent that data in that we did pull out those six phthalates that were in that report, but there were a number of other chemicals that were included in that chemical risk assessment. But if you just compare those six um, and you create a pie chart for kind of what's the uh, contribution of each of the phthalates in that group to the overall toxicity of that mixture. You see for DIMP, which was included in both of these instances, that it's very minimal to negligible 
Um, so the three main low molecular weight phthalates are really driving the toxicity of the mixture. So for DINP, and this is regardless of endpoints now, endpoints were chosen in these two studies for their own, you know, choices. But if you look across all the endpoints, I think it doesn't matter what endpoint you're going to choose. DINP and DIDP have low toxicity and they have very low exposure. And those two factors put into a cumulative risk assessment are going to cause them to kind of fall out of that mixture in terms of adding to significantly to the toxicity of mixture because that toxicity is going to be swamped out by the low molecular weight. So in conclusion, the high molecular weight phthalates are DINP and DIDP are widely used in commerce. The uses relate to structures of specific molecules. High molecular weight phthalates, again, are not toxicologically equivalent to other phthalates. DINP and DIDP have been extensively tested and widely assessed, and I've listed six uh, points on that. So ILSI, RSI, and the CPSC have assessed the carcinogenic potential. The NTP assessed the reproductive and developmental effects. The EU has conducted comprehensive risk assessments. Um, their specific uses have been considered by the CPSC, FDA, and CIR. There's very low exposure that's been estimated uh, via biomonitoring data, and DINP and DIDP are currently REACH registered. Um, I do want to make one comment on carcinogenic potential um, of DINP and DIDP. We did provide extensive comments on the kind of recent hypothesis on alternative mechanisms to carcinogenesis in our comments. They're part of our Prop 65 comments that were uh, provided to California. I believe last year. So we are, we address in those comments a number of the studies and it's not just a select few. There's quite a body of literature that we looked at beyond Ito and Guyton. So um, there's quite a number of other mechanisms that are being considered and papers to uh, consider in that, in that discussion and we've covered them all. So uh, the final point then on cumulative risk, contribution to an overall cumulative risk of phthalates by DINP and DIDP is minimal due to low exposure estimates and low toxicity. That's all I have. Thank you. Questions from the committee? Mike, you look like you have a question. Yeah. Yeah. Which phthalates does ExxonMobil manufacture? DIMP and DIDP. Thank you for this uh, presentation. Um, I think there can be no doubt uh, that DINP is not as potent as some other of the uh, <coughs> low molecular weight phthalates. Uh, but I find it a little tendentious that you um, seem to ignore two pieces of evidence which you quoted in the footnote. I just spotted it. That's a study by Earl Gray, 2000. Gray et al. and Bosch et al. 2004, where they showed that the INP can reduce uh, fetal testosterone levels. Now, it is well known that, you know, all the other uh, low molecular weight phthalates do the same, and they're not very potent at, say, uh, inducing changes in AGD or nipple retention. But would you not um, agree? That the fact that we see reduction of fetal testosterone synthesis points to um, activity in terms of the phthalate syndrome. It's very hard to say based on that one single study because there was no dose response included in that study. It was a single dose at 750 milligrams per kilogram. Two studies. For decreased testosterone. There was the Adamson study, which saw no decrease in Matsutomi study, one of the other ones, saw no decrease, and one saw a decrease from my recollection, but I can certainly look in that to clarify the effects. But regardless, I haven't seen a dose response done for testosterone endpoints for DINP, so it's very hard to make a determination as to what, how potent DINP is in terms of decreasing testosterone and what effect, if any, that continues on to be because in the two generation studies, which we have for DINP and DIDP for that matter, you don't see any of those effects um, that you would expect if it was in fact causing a major decrease in testosterone leading to further effects due to that. So taking the two gen as a definitive study, 
I would say that the decreases in testosterone are not contributing in the way that they do for some of the low molecular weight phthalates. Questions? Uh, one, one more. Um, along the same lines, um, I guess you're only talking about the um, phthalate syndrome types of effects, but are there not other developmental effects um, such as in the Helvig et al. and uh, uh, Waterman studies? Right. So those are the effects that I showed in the table which we do not believe that has, that has anything to do with it being an anti-androgen. Um, the dams are, you know, they're getting doses that are toxic at that point. And so the, therefore the developmental effects, the um, skeletal variations that you see are due to that and not, <coughs> excuse me, not due to any sort of anti-androgenic potential of the chemical. Yes, a clarification or question on slide eight, where you, you um, estimate DINP exposure from all sources. Mm -hmm. did, did those studies measure, was it the monoester MINP, or because that's a very small percent of the metabolites, or did they use the oxidative metabolites? I believe the Woodisec paper. Uh, was oxidative metabolites and Haynes and Cone was MINP. Which is only a few percent, right, of? Well, yeah, I mean, that that is brought up. I mean, I think the point there is that when they've compared the exposures that are back calculated from the urinary metabolites of the monoester versus the oxidative metabolites, they're really not that far off. And I think the the uh, paper, the most recent paper from Wittesec, 2010, demonstrates that, that the exposures are fairly similar and comparable. I mean, you can see that in this chart here. They're not that far off if one's oxidative and the two of them are MINP. But I mean, the overall conclusion there is the exposures are way below the ADI, regardless of whatever monoester or you know, oxidative metabolite you're using to back calculate exposure. So the small differences that you may get, I don't think are going to cause that much of a difference in the numbers that you wind up with, nor the concern that you're going to have from the exposures. I have one question on, on slides five and six for the developmental tox. The, the dosing was done during embryonic periods, basically six to 15. Are there any studies where the dosing goes more into the fetal period? Um, not studies that we have done. There are studies. But published that, studies? Uh, yes, I believe so. In what? The Gray study took it out to, I guess, GD19, and then they looked out past that postnatal day, so you can certainly. And you haven't referenced those here? No. no. We were just using these as kind of the standard one gen, two gen developmental talk studies is what we wanted to talk about in our studies particularly. But certainly there are other studies that have looked at DINP. With substantially similar results or different? Um, different endpoints were examined in other studies, so there aren't any other developmental, you know, standard developmental studies out there to specifically compare to. These are the three. But if you're going to look at other endpoints, then you can start looking into the published literature for other endpoints. So no, there isn't another study out there that has looked for skeletal variations per se. But in, in terms of the um, um, effects that you indicate on slide or on page 10, where there was no reduction in anal genital distance, nipple retention, hypospase, et cetera. When you dose more into the fetal period, do you see those things or not? No. And that's, we're claiming no reduction, no nipple retention. That's based on the published literature. Uh, on total? Absolutely. Okay. Not just on those? No, not just on those developmental studies. That's in total. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to carry on where, where um, our chairman left off. Uh, first of all, uh, this table there, it's not surprising that you don't see very much effects in terms of nipple retention, hyperspadia, et cetera, with phthalates, because the pattern of effects they induce typically uh, in these studies is, is different. It's not like 
you just wouldn't expect these effects very much, very weak, if anything. Let me come back to the three studies which you quoted. I think it was slide five or six. Please. Yeah, wonderful. Um, so they were these studies carried out a protocol that examined all the offspring, all the males, and were these studies designed specifically to look at changes um, we would expect for phthalates, i.e. Uh, fetal androgen synthesis reduction, maybe weak effects on AGD, etc.? No, these, most of those endpoints were not included in these developmental studies. Um, that's, that wasn't a standard. I mean, the standard OECD 414 protocol was used for this, and those endpoints are not included in that. that Would you therefore standard. not conclude that these studies are not so relevant in terms of the concerns and endpoints we're discussing here? Um, if you're going to use them to look for effects of decreased testosterone and anogenital distance, obviously they're not going to be relevant because they didn't look at them. But I think the overall developmental toxicity, yes, these are relevant. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next uh, speaker, Dr. Hallmark. Hey, good afternoon. My name is Nina Hallmark, and I'm standing in front of you today uh, to try and keep you awake after lunch. I hope you've all got enough coffee. This <laughs> is sort of off on the way after lunch. But um, to try and entertain you, and uh, I'm going to be wearing two hats today. Um, one of my direct employer, which is ExxonMobil. I'm based in Brussels, Belgium. But also I'm here um, officially representing an industry trade group today, the European Council of Plasticizers and Intermediate. We're part of a broader European chemicals trade group uh, known as CEFIC, C-E-F-I-C. Um, and the ECPI, just to keep those acronyms in there, um, is, has a broad membership of chemicals manufacturers. And uh, just to show that this is not an ExxonMobil presentation per se, I'd just like to point out one of, my, uh, mem one of the other members of this group, and that's Dr. Reiner Otter from BSF. So what I'd like to do for the next 10 minutes or so is pick up on one of the endpoints that I know that this panel has been tasked with including in the spectrum of endpoints that they're considering for this, uh, this commission. Uh, endocrine disruption is something that's very close to my heart. It's something I have a, a deep research interest in. Um, and I understand it's something that the public are very sensitive to as well. So I think it's really worth spending a few minutes to consider this specific issue. Um, just to outline the talk for just now, um, I was going to spend a moment to introduce two of the chemicals for to focus on. I think Amy's done uh, some of that and Alan will pick it up, so I'm going to go through that very quickly and come quickly onto the point of this talk, which is dis to discuss what is an endocrine disruptor, how do you identify one, and walk through some case studies. And the framework that I'm going to use to evaluate the hazard, potential hazard, poised by the chemicals in the case study is the OECD conceptual framework for endocrine disruption. I've chosen that specifically because there are many ways that people can uh, determine the hazard that chemicals pose, but I believe the OECD framework is the most robust, widely accepted, and it's something that changes with time, so I think it evolves to reflect the data that are generated. And then finally, share my conclusions with you on two of the chemicals that are the purpose of the, the case study. So very quickly, what are DINP and DIDP? Captured in this slide is a, I think I'd like to bring your attention straight away to the bottom of the slide, to websites which expand a lot more on this information. And I've just taken a synopsis of the details from those, the homepage of those websites and presented those here. So DINP is diisononyl phthalate, a substance composed of esters of phthalic acid and isononyl, non <laughs> um, so also known as a C9. 
C9 phthalate because there are uh, typically nine carbons in the in the chains. And then it's a similar chemical, DIDP, diisodecyl phthalate, also known as a C10 phthalate because it has up to 10 carbons in the, in the side chains. So these are also known as high molecular weight phthalates. So to the end point of interest for this presentation is endocrine disruption. And I think it's worth noting that um, Endocrine disruption is not considered a toxicological endpoint per se, not like um, a developmental toxicity where you have a skeletal variation. It's really indicative of a functional change that leads to an adverse effect. And actually that, uh, that description is, is not my own. It's taken from the IPCS Global Framework on Endocrine Disruption. Um, that framework was, came out in 2002 but it builds on um, and includes definitions of what an endocrine disruptor is. And that's something the panel has been deliberating with already this morning, how you define some of the terms that, we, uh, that you need to handle during this, during this evaluation. So I offer you two definitions here for your consideration. The, uh, perhaps one of the first uh, definitions of endocrine disruption was developed at a workshop in Weybridge, UK back in 1996. So this is not a new issue. This is something that's been deliberated for quite some time. And according to Weybridge, an endocrine disruptor is an exogenous substance that causes adverse health effects in an intact organism or its progeny secondary to changes in endocrine function. To my interpretation, that means you may see a reduction in, for example, fetal testosterone, but unless that is paired with actually a phenotypic change, an adverse health effect, that would not meet the definition of Weybridge of an endocrine disruptor. And that's mirrored in the IPCS definition, which says that an endocrine disruptor is an exogenous substance or mixture that alters functions of the endocrine system and, consequently, causes adverse health effects in an intact organism or its progeny or subpopulations. And I'd just like to emphasise subpopulations because even though we're here to discuss human health, these definitions also apply to environmental endpoints as well. So to come to the, the framework to evaluate an endocrine disruptor, uh, what I have here is the OECD framework. And uh, it may not, um, let me see if I can make it a little bigger. How do you think we might do that here? Oh, there's just this guy here, okay. Thank you very much. Okay. I'll leave it even with that help, and I thank you. Um, it still may not be easy to read from the rest of the room, but obviously this has been made available in advance, and a link um, to the OECD website where you can find this has been provided. But really, the purpose of this framework is, is a tool. It's not an answer. It's a, um, a mechanism to help structure how you organize the data that might be available and how you evaluate it to contribute to a weight of evidence approach to help draw conclusions on the biological complexity and detect the potential hazards for endocrine disruption. This is broken into five levels, and I'm going to walk you through each of those levels and give you some examples and some proposed conclusions. Um, as I do that, um, you'll find that I've tried to um, make this very uh, simple for today and use a color coding system. But what I have not done um, in the interest of time today is to provide an exhaustive reference list but I'd like to offer that as a follow-up to today's meeting so that you can um, double-check the references that I used and repeat that investigation if you so wished. So the first level in this concept is to start with level one. It's called the sorting and prioritization based on existing information. And I think that reflects where the, one of the um, tasks that the task force was given this morning starting this de novo evaluation, starting with gathering the information that already exists. And in terms of, of this framework, that comes under three headings, the physical and chemical properties, the human and environmental exposure, and the hazard. And frankly, the rest of this framework focuses on the hazard. Now, for the chemicals that I'm going to look at today, I've chosen four phthalates, 
um, two what we call low molecular weight phthalates, the dibutyl phthalate and the diethylhexyl, and two high molecular phthalates, the diisononyl and diisodecyl. And what I'd like to bring your attention to immediately is that under the EU system, um, two of these phthalates are already classified, and this is in the bottom row of the table, um, both for reproductive effects and actually DBP for aquatic effects as well. So I think of a reasonable conclusion from this slide is that comprehensive hazard assessment data sets are already available, sufficient to demonstrate that not all phthalates are the same, and already to enable risk assessments to the point where classification or non-classification can be decided. That brings us on to level two. And level two provides a framework to evaluate in vitro assays. And there's a list of the typical assays that may exist. OECD is not prescriptive, they don't restrict you to that information. So what we are able to do is to evaluate the literature and interpret the study designs a little more fluidly. These don't have to be OECD guideline studies. This can include a broader spectrum of study of available information. And when you do that, it's reasonable to conclude that in vitro data already exist for these chemicals and they are sufficient to demonstrate that DINP and DIDP are not hormone receptor antagonists. But to be fair, and hence the yellow coding, in vitro data for other mechanisms are inconsistent and inconclusive. But that leads us naturally onto the next level in the framework. So level three, level three looks at what we might also consider as small in vivo studies that are focused on specific um, endocrine mechanisms and effects. For example, estrogenic, androgenic. And I believe that when you have a look at these data, and some of those include um, eutrotrophic assays going back to the 90s. We've got Hirschberger assays that were done in 2007. Um, when you look at all these screening tests, I think you can um, already start to see a dis differentiation between the different phthalates. And to pick up your comment, Andreas, about, I beg your pardon, Professor Kaufmann, about the Borsch and the Gray data, I think it's reasonable to conclude that they should be considered, hence the yellow, the inconclusive colouring at this point. But what that also leads us to um, is the conclusion that in vivo assay data already exists for these chemicals, but the weight of evidence is sufficient to demonstrate that DINP and DIDP are not estrogen or androgen mediators. And this is built on further in level four. Now, um, to pick up on a point from earlier, we do not have the precise OECD 407 studies for any of these particular chemicals. Those guidelines came out quite recently. But when you take a weight of evidence approach and you look at the, for example, the chronic toxicity data done in a range of species, we've got rats, we've got primates, even dogs, there are no data to indicate any endocrine, excuse me, <laughs> uh, endpoints of concern for DINP and DIDP. So in these level four data, looking at whole animals, providing data about multiple endocrine mechanisms and effects, we're really confirming the differentiation story that we saw hinted at with the lower hierarchy data. So in conclusion, for the level four, again, in vivo assay data already exist, sufficient to demonstrate that DINP and DIDP are likely not reproductive system mediators. And I say this and confirm it with the final highest, highest hierarchy tests, the apical studies, looking at, for example, the OECD 416, the 414 to a lesser extent, but I mentioned the 416, the multi-generation study, because that not only considers the susceptible window of concern, but also considers postnatal exposure. So really extrapolates and gives you an opportunity to explore that worst case scenario. So again, when we weigh all these data in, uh, weigh all these data up, we can see that we confirm this differentiation story. These in vivo data exist. These studies have been published, certainly for DINP and DIDP. And to reiterate what Amy said earlier, um, though the summaries are published in the peer-reviewed literature, if you had an interest in full study reports, I believe they could be made available to you. Um, but suffice to say that not only for the um, rodent studies, and these are typically in rats, I'd also like to take this opportunity to mention that environmental studies have also been conducted. And there's a multi-generation study in fish in the Japanese Madaka that looked at DINP, and they also saw no indication of any endocrine, endocrine effects. So in conclusion, for the top level of evaluation, 
I believe it's reasonable to conclude that in vivo data from apical studies already exist for these chemicals, and they are sufficient to support the position that DINP and DIDP are not endocrine disruptors. And on this final slide, I've summarised the conclusions from the previous steps, and I'd just like to add a few further comments. Um, one of them is that in, in line with the definition of the endocrine disruptors uh, with Weybridge and IPCS, I believe that in order to be defined as an endocrine disruptor, whole animal effects should be observed, not just inferred. And finally, I just ask you to consider the relevance of humans to the effects seen. And I mention that because one of the uh, emerging data sets looks at the mouse and, for example, dibutyl phthalate. And there they've been trying to um, identify whether the mouse is as sensitive as the rat for, endo excuse me, for <laughs> endocrine disruption effects. And surprisingly, I believe this is work published by Kevin Guido and his group in 2007, the mouse did not share the rat sensitivity to these endocrine-mediated effects. And to pick up on the comments from the uh, previous panel, uh, I think human relevance is, is critical to this. This is why we do this. This is all about protecting human health. So I would support the idea that further research into the human would be ideal. But also I'm aware of the sensitivity that doing experiments using pregnant women is morally unacceptable. Um, so I think there have to be, have to be some uh, alternative approaches, and I believe that some of that research is underway in the US, in France, and in the UK. And my understanding is that preliminary conclusions suggest that the human is not sensitive to those antiandrogenic effects seen in the rat. The human is more like a mouse. Um, so th I think I will leave you, leave you with that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions? Andreas? Thank you for this presentation. I can say I can agree with most of what you've said, but um, one problem, one issue for clarification, if we turn briefly to your slide number seven, I think, the level two in the OECD conceptual framework, um, it is no surprise that none of these chemicals uh, produce any convincing effects in these essays. Um, are you aware of the new upcoming um, essay looking at uh, steroidal synthesis in vitro H295R cells? Yeah. Are you aware of any data um, concerning phthalates in that in vitro essay? Not off the top of my head, I have to tell you. Okay. So DINP and DIDP have not been tested in that assay? Not in our I know hands, it's no. very new. It's currently, I, I don't know where they are. With OCD, I think it's undergoing validation or yeah, has It's not yet validated, I believe. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, the issue, I can agree with most of what you said because uh, the problem with these assays in the OCD conceptual framework, with most of them, is that they're not exactly tailored to look for these effects we're interested in. Many of them cannot recapitulate the uh, phthalate syndrome, for example. So that is quite widely acknowledged, even by OECD, and they're, they're working on that. So all in all, it's not very surprising what you present to us today. It is correct, but um, how can I say? It sort of somehow misses the important issues we aim to discuss here with endocrine disruption and phthalates in that there's no essay that would look at, say, fetal uh, uh, reduction of fetal androgen synthesis, et cetera, et cetera. They are not validated at OECD level in, in vivo. So this information is really missing. And the other issue with a lot of these uh, OECD framework assays is there are serious question marks as to their sensitivity in capturing some of these endocrine disrupting effects. And I think you capture some good points. Um, where to begin? Um, I think you're right. OECD, they have developed this framework, and really I think the mechanism they had, the biological mechanism they had in mind for this is something that is hormone receptor mediated. And to the best of our knowledge, we believe that that is not how low molecular weight phthalates induce the effects that, they, that we observe. Having said that, I believe that's where the apical studies come in. That's where your multi-generation study come in, comes in, because it doesn't take 
doesn't make any assumptions about the mechanism that's at play. That's a whole, a whole animal assay, and I think if you still see no phenotypic changes, so adverse health effects at that level, um, to me, that, that's the answer you're looking for. <coughs> I was intrigued by your last comment. How did you put it? The human, the human is more like the mouse mm. in response to phthalates. What is the um, scientific evidence you base this on? Is this a published peer-reviewed study? Or? Yeah. The uh, mouse work was done by Kevin Guido. Um, I think that was published 2007, and he basically repeated a rat protocol with dibutyl phthalate. He repeated in the mouse, where he was, lo he was looking at um, exposure of the vulnerable window, and he did the, the fetal testosterone assays, and to his surprise, he did not find equivalent results compared to the rat. He did not see that uh, testosterone change. Um, he saw other changes. Um, but he, he did, not, did not see that antigen change. And the other paper I'd bring to your attention was by a French group, and I forget the lead author, but it's the group of René Habert. And they were able to get hold of um, legally uh, human fetal testicular tissue from legally terminated um, pregnancies in Paris and culture those in vitro and expose those to phthalates, and I uh, beg your pardon, I think it was dibutyl phthalate, um, to see if they could mimic the the reduction in testosterone as well. And so that's a direct test, albeit an in vitro assay. You might consider a screening assay. It would probably come in level two in this framework. But that initial screen saw, saw, no, um, saw no effect on testosterone. Again, it had some indications of other, other changes. Um, and the other paper I'd like to bring to your attention is one that I, I authored, where <laughs> um, also a few years ago. But I did a quick comparison of the, the rat, the marmoset, and the human using a similar protocol to Hebert. So try to do a multi-species comparison, looking again for those testosterone effects. And it was seen in the rat model, not in the human. And we saw um, different changes in the marmoset. And they're all published. Is this, uh, that's, I guess, whole market uh, 2007 in EHP? I believe so. Yeah, and the other one you're referring to is Lombro 2000? Um, it might be about 2007 as well, a yeah, bit later. Okay, then, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we are aware of that. Thanks. Bern? <clears throat> the results that you've talked about at these various levels of testing are all in the individual chemicals. Yes. But <clears throat> one of our concerns is mixtures. If you will, for Look, for example, at the test results on level four, <coughs> where you have clearly distinguished DBP and DEHP from the other two. Yes. If you tested in this same animal model, DBP and DEHP together with one of those that are non-toxic in these assays, <coughs> what do you expect the impact would be? If you use the same dose level of DBP, for example, but diluted that with one of the non-toxic phthalates, what would the model pick up? Rather than guess, I would refer you to a paper that Professor Camp mentioned earlier. It's by Borchettel from 2004. And there they took um, dibutyl phthalate, I beg your pardon, diethyl hexyl phthalate, DHP and DINP, and did a, if you like, a, a simple mixtures experiment. And that, um, from what I recall of the paper, I believe that DHP produced a, a distinct, significantly significant decrease in fetal testosterone. I I'm going to say production because she didn't, um, they didn't take the testes and measure the uh, testosterone content alone. They also took the whole testes, incubated them ex vivo, and measured the testosterone they produced for about three hours ex vivo. So they actually tried to uh, do quite a robust investigation there. And I think what what I recall of the paper is that when you add DINP and DEHP, you don't see much difference compared to DEHP by itself. So the major contributor of that toxicity would be DEHP. I actually, t while I think about it, I believe that the, the dose of DINP was about triple what was provided for dibutyl phthalate because of this um, possible difference in, their, in the strength of their effect. Any other questions? Thank you.
and our next speaker, whose name I don't have. Can I open this for you so that it's yeah, to find that? Good afternoon. My name is Alan Godwin. I'm a senior research associate with ExxonMobil Chemical, and I've been working plasticizers for about almost 30 years in various capacities from technology, manufacturing, as well as the marketing in U.S., Asia Pacific, and, uh, and Europe. So a little bit of experience. And, and some of the questions we heard this morning about telling more about what phthalates are being used and so forth, I hope to address that. Now, recognize that Exxon's position in the market is really based on the products we sell and enter into the business and those end uses we cover. So we really don't have a complete picture where everything is used, but we have a pretty good picture where our types of plasticizers are used. So if you think about uh, plasticizers in the whole scope, I mean, there's a study, uh, I guess the comments before, there were 29 plasticizers, other than the six that have been identified. Well, in reality, it's probably a lot less than in terms of phthalates that have any really significant or any importance. Even the list that someone else had of several plasticizers they saw were issues, some of those are really no longer commercial products, so even the data changes as we go through with it. But uh, we talk about plasticizers and general purpose, and we think general purpose, those are the plasticizers that are used in a wide variety of applications, a wide variety of processes, and just cover numerous end use and segments. There's only a handful of those, and that's the DHP, the DINP, and the DIDP, and the DPHP. So it's really those four that really take up the majority of plasticizer use around. The, uh, and, th and they just really, they just offer the best, best compromise of price, performance, and quality. There's a whole host of specialty plasticizers. They've been with us for a long time. You know, this whole technology of plastici plastization using chemical plasticizers is over 160 years old. Phthalates themselves were first discussed in uh, literature in the early 1900s. Uh, with DOP took off in, in the 1920s as inventions to discover very quickly phthalates became the number one plasticizers because of price and performance. If you look at a study that was published in 1943, at that time the author concluded that 20,000 different chemicals had been proposed to plasticizers. Since that time, based on information, we would say probably the number is close to 30,000 different chemicals in the literature at some time or another have been discussed as plasticizers. Of those, you know, various numbers went into test marketing and so forth. We probably had three or 400 actually went into commercial production. Many of the ones we see today are, were, were developed a long time ago. I think you heard Eastman, uh, Mark Holt, talk about DOTP. It had been around for 40 years. Um, but recognize of those categories of those 30,000, majority of those were non-phthalates. You know, which ones moved into the top four or five? Well, it was those DOP, the DEHP, DINP, DIDP just because they offer the best compromise of product and performance. One of the chart we have over here at the side is looking at uh, global capacity of plasticizers, and that number kind of reflects an estimate uh, of about 10 billion pounds annual production of plasticizer, an annual capacity. And where we are today with, with non-phthalates is just very small at this point. But to get to that air area, if you had to replace that, it's going to take a substantial investment and a substantial amount of time in order to displace the phthalates. And I, we don't have a copy of this uh, presentation with you, but we'll make sure that you, you have it on your system. So, again, not all plasticizers are used as, or phthalates are used as plasticizers. And there's some categories in solvents, such as you see with the cosmetics uh, and issues. Some are used as fragrances and issues. But uh, we get into where the plasticizers are. And those are they're added polymers to make them more flexible. Once they're fused, this is fairly stable. But plasticizers are not chemically bound. They can migrate under heat or extreme stress or with some sort of extracting media. Uh, plasticizers are generally poor solvents for the, for the polymer at room temperature. Uh, they have a low volatility. Uh, they, they have to have the ability to, to make it more flexible. There was a recent study that was just published uh, this year, for research in Spain, where they actually took DHP and chemically bound it to the PVC molecule. And when you look at the data, it, it sounds nice from the topic of the paper, but when you look at it, the material is no longer flexible. So, to, to, so these are all things that take into place. For phthalate esters, you can have just a wide variety of plasticizers, different from all the other molecules. The range of alcohols can go from C4 to C13. It's uh, combinations of various out there. You can throw some aromatic rings in there, and you get a whole variety of polymers or plasticizers. You know, we look at different plasticizers that are around. We look at general purpose plasticizers. Uh, 
the attributes you'd like to find are low cost, UV stability, adhesion, heat stable, stain resistance. These are all categories that someone making a product is going to look rel relative to their plasticizer. A lot of alternatives are around, uh, we hear things talking about citrates and oxidized soybean oil or natural oil products or DOTP or, uh, and, and DENCH. And they, they all have uh, applications specific that are growing. Uh, we see those things. They have some, some, they're not as good in many ways. They don't process as well. They may not have the long-term compatibility. They may not have the long-term stability. Uh, you know, DEH or DOTP has been around for, for 40 years, and it's only really in the last couple years that it's come across as a, as a phthalate replacement because people are looking at alternatives, and this seems to be, you know, one of the high ones on the list along with DENCH and a few other ones. You know, if we look at the U.S. plasticizer market and so forth, this is taking uh, 2008 phthalate uh, ester demand. Uh, here's your major ones that you can see on the chart with the DINPs and DIDPs and the DPHPs. Those C9 and C10 phthalates take up about 50% of that market. You'll see a little bit of DOTP uh, also on this chart by this uh, 2008 scale. Other phthalates, uh, the question was asked before, what plasticizers does Exxon produce? Well, we produce DINP and DIDP. Those are our two main products. But we also sell DTDP, which is a C13 plasticizer, an L11, uh, L911, and a 911 uh, product. So, and they all have specific end uses that they're tailored to. Uh, on the phthalates themselves, they represent, represent about 85, 84 to 85 percent of the uh, U.S. market, but that other 15 to 16 percent being the wide variety of, of non-phthalates. Applications they go to, the pie chart at the lower level, uh, you probably can't read that from your seats, but, you know, flooring, wiring cable, uh, consumer products, uh, those are all the big ones. Uh, medical is, is smaller, automotive, uh, you know, coatings and, and then a variety of smaller end uses. But the big ones are the wiring cable, building construction, uh, consumer flooring, those, those are the big end uses for, for, for phthalate plasticizers. Uh, this chart, uh, again, if we just take uh, kind of a quick summary of our, just a real quick snapshot of the market that we would see, uh, not to meant to be uh, completely accurate in every scale of possibility, but you can see where the top ones, at the top of the chart, we have the solvents, creams, cosmetics, and fragrances. Those are your very low molecular weight plasticizers or phthalate esters, the, the, the dimethyl, diethyl, dipropyl, dibutyl. But as you start getting more towards specific end uses, you can see how the center part of the table has a lot of checks. That's really where the DINPs, DIDPs, and DPHPs uh, are, have potential use. And as we go through this, uh, this table, looking at these, you can find that if people look for cosmetics and creams, they're going to choose things like C1 to C4 phthalates. Yet they wouldn't use uh, some of the higher molecular weight ones that you would, you would find that, uh, that we'd be talking about, the DINPs and DIDPs. You move towards wire and cable. Uh, the classic point would be the building wire you have in, inside your home. And you put that, you buy a new home, you want to make sure that wire is safe and it lasts for 30 or 40, 50 years because the replacement is cost and the safety risk is very high. So people tend to make choices about plasticizer based on those products that will give them a long, safe life and not have to worry about it. So inside that wall, you're going to find uh, uh, the, the insulation material may use trimelitates and linear phthalates, uh, as well as on the jacketing material would have uh, DIDP or DPHP looking at that. You wouldn't find low molecular weight plasticizers or citrates or or anything else because those things just uh, won't, won't be seen as lasting long. And other applications, again, the specifications of the performance of the wires always tend to dictate what kind of products. A wide variety of products can be used and things, but in general, you're not going to find the low molecular weight products. You may find some with DEHP or DOTP uh, used there in addition to the other products. You move on to construction products, uh, non-building wire, non-flooring. Uh, you know, and again, the varieties can change. You may find acrylic caulks and sealants, such as, you know, your painter's caulk that you would use in rooms. They would tend to use more of the low molecular weight plasticizers, the, the butyl benzyls or uh, possibility in that, uh, where you get into a couple of times, as mentioned, vinyl siding using plasticizers. Actually, that's a very, very small end use. Uh, uh, most of your vinyl siding is, uh, is rigid PVC, which may have a some type of acrylic cap stock on it, but there are some products out there that will have a plasticized PVC cap stock, just that thin layer on the outside surface where the pigment is and the antioxidants so that they can provide, uh, you know, a, a long lifetime history of, of uh, good color stability and, and uh, good stability in that product. Uh, 
you know, for automotive interiors, uh, one of the key sections on, or key criteria is the inside the car's ability to uh, maintain low levels of fogging. Uh, if you remember back in the 70s and so forth, you would always tend to have on the inside the cars when the sun would hit it, you'd find these oil films develop on the inside your wind windshield. Well, well, those are coming by volatile components used inside the car. And the automotive industry over the past, uh, really beginning in, in, the, uh, in the early 1980s, has been working to reduce and improve those emissions. And they changed the plasticizer. So while it used to be uh, DEHP was used to a lot inside a car, it's, it's almost not used there today. They've moved to heavy molecular weight products as DIDP or DPHP, or even some of the heavier uh, linears 11s and, and trimelotates and so forth. Again, you wouldn't find the low vol volatility products being used there. Under body seating, sealants, uh, uh, you know, a lot of the foreign cars, uh, some Japanese imports made in the U.S. would have a undercoating applied uh, underneath the chassis to protect it for long service life. And again, you, you would choose plasticizers based on those products which help improve that efficiency of application to, to keep it worse. You've got to heat these cars up to the fusion temperature to, to seal the product, so they basically coat the car, throw it in an oven, heat it up to uh, a fusion temperature, and so your higher molecular weight products just have it more difficult to process there. If you look for vinyl flooring uh, or resilient flooring or PVC carpeting, the industry is changing a little bit. You're finding a tremendous growth of uh, the DOTP products growing in these areas, uh, but also the dibenzoates, uh, as Mark Holt mentioned earlier, uh, butyl benzothalates used there. Uh, issues they would like to have in choices are stain resistance, long color, uh, good stability, non-yellowing, uh, things they want to have a product that lasts for a long period of time. For PVC back carpeting, people would choose plasticizers that uh, when they process it, it doesn't damage the fibers of the carpet. You know, there's a temperature limit that the nylon would have, and if it says it higher temperature than that, they're going to make choices based on that. So they would tend to use plasticizers like DINP, the lower molecular weight of the series, although they may get by with DIDP or DOTP. And again, in those applications, you wouldn't find the C1 to C4 phthalates being used. For medical products, uh, we're not in the medical business. Uh, uh, we don't, we don't, not a DEHP producer. Uh, so our, our view of this is probably uh, uh, less accurate than some of my colleagues and other companies may able to provide. But uh, again, long history, safe use, uh, can it resist changes in, in color change and sterilization, low color, high purity? Uh, those are all the things people look for for plasticizers. They want products that they know are safe and can be used for a long time. If you look for shoes uh, or for clothing products, shoes, inks, and handbags, they, they all have different choices people would use. You're, you could find DINP and DIDP, DPHP, DOP, DOTP, all used in those applications at various levels uh, for products. Uh, and, and the last slide here, just a series of miscellaneous applications from furniture to garden hose to, to tablecloths to shower curtains, floor mats. Uh, and, and even toys, and, and you're going to just to find a wide variety of plasticizers used there. But again, for most of those, with the exception of toys, you would find DID, DINP and DIDP and DPHP and uh, DOTP having potential use in all those areas. But you wouldn't find the C1 to C6 phthalates, unlikely to find citrates, uh, unlikely to find the, the heavier phthalates in those areas. For toys, uh, you know, the world is changing there. There was a 2008 study published uh, at an a, a analytical journal in, in Switzerland where they looked at toys. I think they analyzed uh, over 300 parts of 270-some toys. And, and again, Dench, as was mentioned earlier before, represented about 50% of those products. But you also find uh, on that list had about another 20 types of plasticizers there being used in addition to citrates and DOTP, a whole host of some, you know, mesomol products as well as some polyol esters from uh, uh, LG chemical and, and, and variety of things, epoxidized sorbonyl and so forth. So it's a wide variety of things that are being used. So that was my quick overview and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Questions? And you will be providing us copies of your presentation. I think one of the issues that we have to deal with is what are the sources? Yes. And, uh, and we're happy to provide more time, more information on that. Uh, put questions down. We'll, we'll spend a lot of time working that for you. Great. Thank you. So can I just <coughs> um, So 
Thank you for that overview. Um, so if I'm sitting in my car and I've got sun's coming in and heating things yeah. up, is it inhalation exposure that, that I'd be <coughs> worried about? Uh, Not from phthalates. Most of the studies done now where they come back and look at inside cars and so forth, they're finding it's, it's coming from the, uh, uh, the fabrics themselves, is maybe polyurethane chemistries and so forth. So, you know, it's... Uh, but your discussion, then you went into uh, carpets and things um, is yeah, well, it inhalation the exposure in, in all of those products that you're thinking about for human exposure, or is it? I mean, I, I recognize lotions. I'm going to yeah. worry about dermal. What 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 kind of exposures would are you thinking? Well, I'm, you know, I'm not the expert to, to get into that, but you're. Uh, I'm certainly it's probably it's, it's not food, but it's it's either going to be inhalation or skin contact. Uh, in an automobile itself, for most of your. Uh, your, your vinyl products that you have, your, your, your body's not resting on. So it's, you know, in a leather car, a leather seat in your automobile, well, it's, it's the, the sides, it's the back, you know, it, it's underneath, which is, uh, which is PVC. Your armrest where you sit in the back of your seat is all leather. So in, in those mechanisms, I would say, yes, the only potential route you would have would be uh, inhalation, it would be. But again, the automobile industry has looked at that through setting their fogging specs to to really minimize that exposure potential. And, and there's certainly tests where people show that when they do this, that they don't, uh, they, they don't see that being a problem at this point. It's now other types of chemicals that are there. Uh, carpeting uh, in, in, a, in a building where you've got vinyl back carpeting, yes, that, that vinyl is, is on the floor. Uh, there's no way that you could come and contact that with, uh, you know, I guess, unless you wanted to crawl underneath the carpet. but. Uh, the only way you could get that exposure would be inhalation. But again, these think products have very, very low vapor pressures. And, uh, you know, and so the exposure risk in, in, as a non-toxicologist thing, expert, would be, uh, would be very minimal. Follow up on that, wouldn't, I mean, you were just talking about the carpet and the vinyl backing. I mean, wouldn't it degrade with time and form small particles and dust and adhere to a way in which child, you know, very young children are exposed on the floor? I, and I, I don't know what the mechanism of that is, to be honest. Uh, I've, I've heard, you know, those kind of questions come up before, and we've exchanged ideas uh, from the company, but, you know, how, how, it, how it falls apart and so forth and breaks up, I really don't know. As a, it, you would expect, though, that one, the level to be very, very long, uh, in time intervals. I mean, you know, PVC flooring can last in a home 25 years, and people replace it not because it's, uh, you know, brittle and falling apart, but usually because you know, the housewife wants a new look. Uh, you know, so it, it's still, still most of the plasticizers in there, but certainly if you did have extreme conditions where heat was hitting something and, and you had a higher vapor pressure than you would like to, you know, seen with the plasticizer choice, uh, you could get some embrittlement, and friction on top of that could create some uh, some small particles. Again, I'm just trying to think of where all this stuff is coming. So yeah. people have been talking about shower curtains, yeah. uh, hot water on a shower curtain. Is that going to, what's the problem? Is it, the, is it an inhalation problem potentially there? Is it a... Again, the vapor, most of your shower curtains that are made, uh, you're either going to be made with, uh, you know, DEHP or DINP or DIDP, and the vapor pressure on those molecules is fairly low. I would think that if anything where you're seeing plasticizer loss, you know, could come from just repeated water hitting it, which would go down the drain. I think there's always confusion that people would say the new vinyl odor is plasticizer. You know, or if you get by that shower curtain and you open that bag up, you know, there's an odor with that. Well, that's not the plasticizer. That's some of the stabilizers that are added into the system. So, but as far as, you know, anybody measuring the vapor pressure released, uh, you know, of a plasticizer in a hot shower, you know, I've never seen any studies on it. A lot of my questions come from, I'm thinking about, you know, studying in Haynes data, mm -hmm. the, um, where it's clear in biomonitoring studies that humans are exposed to, to yeah. phthalates. So, and then we have this list of all these products that these phthalates are coming from. Uh, what, in your best judgment, where do you think the problems are? 
it's, it's hard for me to understand. You know, it, with phthalate, you know, if you look around a room like here, you know, you know PVC, you, you have these rubber mats here. You have this strip across the floor is PVC. Uh, some of the wiring may be plasticized PVC. In a, in a television set, probably n nothing is there. They, they worry about migrations there. So, I mean, it's, it's around a lot. This floor mat may have the back end, the back side of that could, in fact, be plasticized PVC. So, uh, you know, it's just the product My point is that biomonitoring studies show that, that we have these chemicals, you know. I, I'd heard people say that food was the number one, you know, uh, contribution from it, but uh, the food contact uh, for things, uh, you know. And it's not my my area of expertise. So. I mean, potentially, how how far down the supply chain um, <clears throat> do you, do you know or have information on? Um, you know, obviously, you don't make carpets and cable and all these other things, but. How much can information do you have? Because that's the kind of thing we're going to need. I, I think from most of these end uses, we can probably come up with pretty good. I mean, if we're selling to people making carpets, I mean, we have a pretty good idea of what they're using, how they're using, what types of products they go into. The one big gap is in the industry is that uh, it's a compounding industry where we would sell plasticizers to uh, a, a company who would take and convert those to pellets, and those pellets would go to a wide variety of systems and in uses that we would, you know, not be familiar with. And uh, so you, know, you can get pretty close. You can probably cover, you know, probably 80% of the market between companies like Exxon and Eastman and Ferro and BSF uh, working about where those products go. But, you know, getting 100% may be, uh, everything may be really tough. And um, want to head right on to panel four. Oh, good afternoon. Thank you very much for uh, rearranging the schedule for my convenience. I appreciate that. Uh, my name is Jane Tata. Uh, I have over uh, 30 years experience as an epidemiologist designing, conducting, reviewing studies. I had my training at uh, Yale University where I have my uh, master's in biostatistics and my uh, doctorate in epidemiology. And if you look at this first slide, and you see DRPH, that is not a phthalate, that is doctor of public health. <laughs> there are a lot of Ds, and Ps, and Hs today. Um, I'm here at the request of the American Chemistry Council Phthalate Esters Panel. Uh, I want to recognize the contribution of my colleagues at Exponent on the Fuller Report that I hope you've all had a chance to look at, and that is uh, Dr. Jean Manson, who's a reproductive toxicologist and a clinical epidemiologist, and Megan Wagner, another epidemiologist, and they're colleagues of mine at Exponent, which is a consulting company based in California. Over the past decade, an increasing number of epidemiology studies have appeared in the scientific literature investigating in utero biomarkers of phthalate exposures and subsequent birth outcomes and developmental effects 
in uh, children and infants. Several studies have investigated associations with gestational age. While one study each uh, considered an association with cryptorchidism or undescended testicles uh, and anagenital distance, a number of studies have focused on neurodevelopmental effects such as reduced cognitive function and adverse behavioral outcomes using uh, biomarker phthalate metabolite exposure measurements at older ages, the neuro studies. A few other studies have explored possible hormonal disruption using phthalate metabolite measurements in maternal breast milk or from children's urine samples. In general, these studies have a number of common characteristics. They all start out with a proposed hypothesis based on animal results. They spend a fair amount of time enumerating, most of them anyway, the, the general limitations of their work, many of which they have in common, and I will discuss those. And then they talk about possible mechanisms for any of the positive or um, statistically significant associations that were observed. And routinely, they call for more research. Doesn't surprise you. Virtually all of the studies report one or more statistically significant associations. Causal interpretation of these findings is probl problematic, however, due to several limiting factors, often well described by the investigators. I will discuss the strength of the epidemiologic evidence in light of the challenges that researchers have faced that include these, exposure misclassification, lack of consistency in findings, lack of replication, residual confounding, weak associations, and multiple comparisons. Let's start with exposure misclassification. This thing out of the way. <clears throat> Most authors raise the issue of whether their study captured the appropriate window of exposure. Given the short half-lives, less than 24 hours, of phthalate biomarkers, DEHP metabolites were shown not to be particularly stable, uh, highly re reproducible, I should say, during the last six weeks of the third trimester by ADB et al. Other studies, however, have suggested relative stability of phthalate biomarkers for weeks or months, that is, among men and non-pregnant women. The metabolism of pregnant women changes rapidly, and they have a 30 percent increase in circulating uh, blood vo volume. Of particular concern are cross-sectional neurobehavioral studies that attempt to link spot urines of elementary school children and link it to parental or teacher uh, neurobehavioral performance ratings. These are typically cross-sectional studies, so they're taking the urine sample and the phthalate level, and at the same time they're doing the testing in their older children. Wolf et al. appropriately call for a more comprehensive, integrated exposure assessment prenatally and before puberty. Let's talk about consistency. Where there are multiple studies of some endpoint, the results have not demonstrated reasonable consistency. This uh, particularly is the case for studies that have examined uh, length of gestation at, at our gestational age of delivery, and there are a number of them. Wyatt et al. reported a statistically significant inverse relationship of DEHP metabolites and gestational age of delivery. This finding is consistent with that of Latini, Lantini et al., who measured MEHP in cord blood. It is inconsistent, however, with Wolf et al., who reported statistically significant positive associations of low molecular weight phthalate metabolites and MEHP with gestational age. ADB et al. also reported increasing gestational age with increasing DEHP metabolites. It is noteworthy that although the results were divergent, both Wyatt et al. and Wolf et al., their studies were conducted among um, uh, African-American and Hispanic New York City mothers. 
though they had different results, but they were using very similar populations, with 311 mothers in the former study and 404 in the latter. Metabolite concentrations were also similar in these two studies. Meeker et al. reported a positive odds ratio of borderline statistical significance for preterm birth for the metabolite MEHP, comparing cases and controls, all of whom had greater than median levels of exposure. While Adibi et al. reported an inverse association for preterm birth and DEHP metabolites. In a nested case control study of cryptorchidism, Maine et al reported no differences in the metabolites measured in mother's milk or differences in gestational age between boys with undescended testicles and controls. Still sticking with the consistency issue, uh, Engel et al. did two neurobehavioral studies, one in newborns and one when these children reached four to nine years of age. Both reported sex-specific effects. Newborn girls showed a significant linear decline in orientation and quality of alertness with increasing concentrations of high molecular weight phthalate uh, metabolites. Boys showed a different pattern with some indication of better motor performance with higher concentrations of low molecular weight phthalates metabolites. In the study of older children, however, boys exhibited poorer scores with increasing concentrations of low molecular weight phthalate exposures. Lack of replication. First time reports of associations, particularly studies employing novel methodology, require replication before a causal association can be considered seriously. For example, there have been no other studies of antigenital distance and exposure to phthalates in humans other than the one by Swan et al. and her colleagues, and a subsequent study by Swan alone. Studies that examined similar outcomes are not true replications if the source of exposure is substantially different. Such as studies where exposures were sampled from urine versus cord blood uh, or, or breast milk. This is a little more of a, an epidemiologic concept, but I think it's very important in these studies, and it's called residual confounding. I think most folks know what confounding in is. It's another explanation for a result. Uh, in order to have confounding, the, the factor has to be a cause of the outcome, but it also has to be associated with exposure. Those two things to be a confounder. But when we say residual confounder, we mean whatever the measure was for the confounding may have not captured it all. So if we use, for example, education uh, to, to reflect um, socioeconomic status, for example, we may capture some of that confounding, but not all of it, because we don't have the true confounder measured. Um, with many studies, when, when folks talk about error, they say, well, the results could have been even stronger, but there was misclassification or differential or non-differential misclassification. When you're talking about confounding, when you have errors in confounding, it can result in either under or overestimation of risk. It could go either way when you don't have the confounder right. Errors in measurement or inadequate surrogates for confounders can result in residual confounding and bias risk estimates in either direction. The existing studies have collected information on numerous variables. We heard about that this morning. That may be confounders, most from parent questionnaires. There's a long list of covariates that are known or suspect risk factors for developmental effects uh, in children. For example, age, sex, ethnicity, race, mother's pre-pregnancy height, her weight, body mass index, smoking history, education, IQ, marital status, and history of asthma, hypertension, and diabetes. To confound the no association, a risk factor also would have to be associated with exposure to phthalates. Maine et al. note the possibility of unknown factors related to phthalate exposure. While knowledge is incomplete of the distribution of phthalate exposures, 
a few important characteristics have emerged. Minorities, those of lower socioeconomic status, and obese persons typically have higher levels of phthalate metabolites in their bodies. Many of the study authors tested for confounding with these variables by examining the effect with and without the factor in the statistical model, which is standard technique. Uh, the effectiveness of this approach relies on the accuracy of parental recall. So you're asking women what they weighed, and you have to trust that you're getting the right answer. <laughs> For example, Wolf et al. reported a positive but small statistically significant correlation between low molecular weight phthalate metabolites and body mass index, but raised the issue of crude estimates of maternal anthropometric uh, features based on maternal self-reports. Uh, a key problem, it's, it's statistical, but I think it's very important, is that most of the researchers had some cutoff for putting a confounder in the model because you don't want, if you put too many things in the model, it's not parsimonious. You have to, to estimate too many variables and you lose power. So people try to cut it down to the important ones. So they said, well, let's, let's only put it in if it creates a change of 10% or more. The problem you have is then you knock some off because they didn't come to the 10%. So you don't put them in the model. Now you get a positive finding of 4%, 5%, 6%. Could have easily have been the confounder, but you didn't put it in the model for good reason. So it still leaves that issue outstanding. It has been estimated that 90%, and this is an important statistic, of DEHP intake, except for infants, is from food. 90%. This is according to Cavlock in a paper in EHP in 2006, 90% from food. The most influential food products are fats, oils, and dairy products. So the real question now is, does body mass index capture that if that's a confounder? It's related to exposure. We expect people who eat heavy fats, oils, have more adverse reproductive effects or developmental effects than their, you know, their children. Uh, so have we really captured that? If these food product, product, products are independent predictors of risk for developmental effects or hormonal alterations, they could also be confounders in an association between DEHP and developmental effects. While most studies that have examined this association control for body mass index or body weight, there is uncertainty as to whether these variables adequately control for potential dietary confounding. No study has attempted to control specifically for dietary intake. Weak associations. Um, when epidemiology studies have weak associations, that is the magnitude of the increase is small or the dose response is borderline significant, those kind of weak associations, then any kind of error in your study, whether it be confounding or poor information, uh, could easily have been an explanation for what you see. We always feel more comfortable with a big risk because then we think, well, it's less likely than any mistakes in the conduct of the study um, could have explained it. So many of the associations observed in these studies were not statistically significant, and therefore, assuming no error, chance findings, or they're insensitive due to small sample sizes when, <coughs> when they're not statistically significant, but they show an association. Where you do get statistical significance, they are generally of low magnitude which could easily be due to study limitations. Another challenge, the interpretation with weak associations, is whether they are clinically relevant. The endpoints examined in the developmental studies are of unknown significance, either because of subtle changes observed or because the relationship to a clinical diagnosis is absent. Seven years ago, Latini et al. discussed the need for a clearer understanding of the clinical relevance of their measured associations between phthalate metabolites and shorter gestational age. In 2008, Wolf et al. noted the small effect sizes uh, related to longer length of gestation. 
Adibi et al., who also reported longer length of gestation associated with higher levels of phthalate metabolites, commented, and I quote, the clinical, pop uh, the clinical or population significance of two to three days in gestational length is difficult to evaluate. In the Wolf et al. study, the weak associations between low molecular weight phthalate biomarkers with the timing of puberty in girls was in contrast to the inverse relationship with high molecular weight phthalate biomarkers. None of the adjusted prevalence ratios was statistically significant, and there were no notable differences from the null. Engel et al. reported poor parent-rated behavior and executive functioning in boys, not girls, associated with low molecular weight phthalates, not high. Although few children, and this is what's important, for the clinical significance. Few children met the standard at-risk or clinic clinically significant criteria. Maine et al., on the other hand, did a study where they actually took a clinical endpoint, cryptorchidism, and reported no association with any of the six phthalate metabolites measured in mother's milk. Finally, multiple comparisons. Since the studies are exploratory in nature, Many of them have analyzed multiple phthalate metabolites and multiple outcomes. Given a large number of comparisons, some associations will be statistically significant just due to chance. Meeker et al. referred to the, quote, large number of statistical comparisons. Wolf et al. noted that their statistically significant associations may be due to multiple comparisons. Multiple comparisons are particularly problematic for studies of neurodevelopmental effects. Engel et al., for example, included behavioral rating inventories of 86 and 130 item questionnaires that were examined separately for boys and girls. So you have 86 and plus 130, and then they did them for boys, did them for girls, did them for high metabolites, did them for low molecular weight metabolites, resulting in over 800 comparisons. Swan et al. included over 500 comparisons while examining reduced masculine play in boys. Biomarker studies of deve developmental effects pose numerous challenges. The criteria for causation, such as consistency, biologic plausibility, magnitude of risk, and even temporality, um, as several of these were cross-sectional in design, are far from satisfied across the whole gamut of the studies of phthalate metabolite exposures and birth outcomes and developmental effects. The few studies uh, suggesting a dose response are uncertain due to questions of residual confounding and exposure misclassification. Because of these challenges, authors are appropriately cautious in their interpretation of the observed weak and inconsistent associations. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Questions? Russ? I guess quite, quite a few, but just uh, I, I think what you're um, pointing to in, in terms of epidemiologic studies is, is correct. I mean, not just the epidemiology of phthalates and reproductive or developmental health, but air pollution studies, lead, et cetera. I mean, all of <clears throat> these limitations that you point out are possibilities in uh, epidemiologic studies, so I wouldn't you know, disagree. I mean, this is inherent in the field. It's not specific to this topic area. Well, they are known epidemiologic limitations that one has to consider in drawing conclusions about causation, but uh, environmental epidemiology is particularly subject to difficulties. I have done occupational epidemiology studies for 30 years and do not suffer, our studies don't suffer from as many of these limitations. This is a particularly difficult, when you're doing biomarkers, a single sample, that's different from other studies, it, it's more challenging. Well, possibly, but um, in, in terms of the, these limitations, when you, you know, you just mentioned a biomarker, a single urine sample, um, most of the time or all the time you really need to think about 
the magnitude of the bias and the potential direction of the bias. Um, and I agree with you that with confounding, it can be in either direction. With mismeasurement of exposure, if you only have a single urine sample during pregnancy or um, <clears throat> at a single time and uh, point in time, that will most likely lead to what we call measurement error and misclassification. And that's where you mentioned, you know, the, the traditional uh, bias towards the null. If it's a, a binary exposure variable, once you get more than two categories, three or more categories in your exposure, then that general rule of thumb uh, fails on occasion. And it's been it's published about that. If you, in other words, if you have more than one. Yeah, no, that, that's true. I mean, it, it can fail on occasion. It's, it's rare, but I mean, that gets to a much finer point. But I guess a, a bigger point, one, one of the things I wanted to caution, though, is when you're talking about clinical relevance, is um, to be cautious in, in terms of clinical relevance to an individual versus a population. Because a small change in, uh, you, you, you presented on some of the gestational age studies. I mean, I would have thought maybe, you know, maybe some of the hormonal studies or others. But a small change in um, a continuous measure may not be adverse for an individual. And the best example, which um, data that was collected, you know, several decades ago looking at lead and IQ, the um, lead literature showed about a two-point change in IQ, and for an individual, that probably would or would not be clinically relevant. I mean, you would probably have the same job that you're doing now. You'd probably um, be, you know, sitting in this room or not, regardless of whether your IQ is two points above, uh, above what it is now or lower. But clearly on a population level, if you shift the population central tendency down to IQ points, you can affect the tail of the distribution. I understand so your it, point. Um, I'd like to mention, however, this was not original on my part, that the authors themselves raised this. And what I found, I'm not a biologist, as you know, my background's from statistics into epidemiology, not biology. But what I found extremely odd is that the studies that had a longer gestation, one or two days, would have a neat little biologic mechanism to explain it. And the ones that had shorter also had another explanation for that. And they both treated it as if it was a bad thing. Um, I mean, one or two days either way. I couldn't even figure out myself what, what's a good result and what isn't. No one's going to be right on gestation age, especially with the difficulty of even um, measuring it. And many of these studies just use mother's last menstrual period, and not many of them use clinic. So that's what I mean, how relevant. If, if for sure, you knew for sure you were extending gestation by one or two days, and that was truth, yeah, you know, maybe that means for population that might mean something. Well, I wasn't so much referring to the gestational age, but just, IQ. just to, you know, careful distinguishing between what is a, a clinically relevant effect for an individual which is more in the clinical medical realm versus a population level. And um, I would tie it more closely to things like shifts in antigenal distance in populations, which may be indicative of, let's say, hormonal changes or changes in serum hormone levels in individuals, rather than, you know, I know the gestational age literature is murky. I was actually an author on mm -hmm. the Wyatt and the Adibi paper, which, you know, found opposing uh, results. But um, I think for some of the effects that the, the panel's uh, interested in, in terms of um, antigenal distance, hormonal changes, um, that be cautious in, in terms of what's clinically relevant for an individual and on a population level. But when you say uh, hormonal changes, that's, that's one thing. I think we heard this morning the association with adverse effects for an endocrine disruptor as opposed to modulating someone's hormonal levels. Again, I'm not a biologist, but I know a lot of things modulate our hormonal levels. So it, it's got to 
tie itself somehow in, to a clinical entity. That's why I pointed out the one study that actually did look at cryptorchidism and didn't see anything. But you may have seen some changes in hormones. So just pointing out that's just another thing to be cautious in interpretation. But yes. Um, in your slide entitled Multiple Comparisons, you highlight the um, problems with multiple comparisons, uh, which I think are, uh, that point is well appreciated. Is your specific point with the study by Engel et al. and Swan et al., both 2010, that they didn't make adjustments for multiple comparisons, or what is your point no. precisely? No, in, in my training at Yale, we were made very well aware of multiple comparisons, but we were not trained to make adjustments for it. I think things can get very conservative if you do start doing Bonferroni adjustments. What you do is you take it into account in your interpretation. It makes the case for replication or consistency so much stronger. But you can make adjustment for multiple comparison. Bonferroni okay. correction is you one. Can. <clears throat> there are many other methods, as you full well know. Is your point specifically that Swan et al. and Engel et al. did not make these adjustments? No, that's not my criticism. My criticism. What is your point? My point is when you evaluate these studies and you go to interpret them in terms of do you think this is really cause and effect, you have to consider how many comparisons they did, how many significant findings they had, and did anyone else see the same thing? Was it an a priori hypothesis? In other words, if an end, end point is stated up front, this is what I'm looking for, this particular end point, not just neurobehavioral effects, but you know, more aggression or more, and they said it up front and they got it, be less likely to say it's multiple comparisons. But when you just start, let's look at all neurocognitive, neurobehavioral, and we got 150 of these, and, and you get something, you have to say, well, Let's look. There's got to be more studies to look at this. I can't make much of it. Is that. your point then that multiple comparisons should not be made? Uh, n no, there are ways um, to make it less of a problem. Which are? Can you well, yes, give I, an exa example? Um, I'll give you an example, although some <laughs> the grouping. Um, trying to put the phthalates into categories. Now you could sit around and debate what categories. A lot of people say the low and the high was not a great one because some of the animal studies of some of the low showed a problem and some of them didn't and you put them both together may not be the best thing to do. But suppose you group those that show effects in rodents and make that one group. So you're not looking at eight different phthalates. And then set up front your outcome. I'm going to look at length of gestation, for example. Now, that doesn't mean later on somebody does a study and they see another outcome that you didn't focus on. You may go back to your data and look at it, <coughs> but try to, uh, in your protocol, design it to reduce the number of comparisons uh, that you make. Well, yes, your points are well taken. Multiple comparisons is a problem, but through adjustment, uh, one can still distill out, as you full well know, uh, statistical significance. This is possible. Which leads me on to my next question. You made a lot of points which are very well taken and well acknowledged in epidemiology, especially environmental epidemiology. And we all agree with you, I think, that this is a very difficult and challenging area. However, the field has developed in the last 20, 30 years, and there are quite sophisticated methods available to distill out and correct for possible bias, confounding, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Can you highlight any of the studies which you quote that, in your opinion, fall behind the scientific state of the art in that area, apart from the general problems every study of this kind grapples with? Well, I'd certainly consider any of the cross-sectional studies weaker and put them in a whole different category. Weaker, I would agree with, but would they fall below the scientific state of the art? You know, they get published. Cross-sectional studies get published. They have to be considered. We consider all the data, but I wouldn't give them the weight I would give to the studies that are, have a longitudinal pattern to them. 
I, I think everyone in this room would agree with you there, but can you highlight a study then? I mean, you made many criticisms and implied criticisms. Can you highlight any study or a series of studies which you quoted, which in your opinion are beyond the pale? I think they're all very similar. I tried to make that point in the beginning when I said they have the common characteristics. Other than the cross-sectional, they all seem very similar. They all took one spot urine random. They all did that. Um, they focused pretty much on high and low phthalates. Um, they struggled with confounders, all of them. I saw a lot of similarities in the limitations that you don't usually see across the board in one area. So I'm not able to say this one is, you know, better than all the others. They're, they all struggle, and I'm not being crit it's, it's a difficult area. I again agree with you there, but the, what the points you describe are not really specific to any phthalate epidemiology. What you, everyone struggled in environmental epidemiology with confounding, with misclassification, with multiple comparisons, etc., etc. And there are ways of dealing with it, and that's the scientific state of the art. So would you say that the phthalate epidemiological studies as a group fall behind what other researchers do in this area of environmental epidemiology? I think these limit, many of these limitations are characteristic of this particular area of research. And I think it's the, the one-time measurement, uh, which may not be a limitation in some other kind of environmental study. But I think in general, this is characteristic of environmental studies. But I do know there are new methods coming out, new approaches to studying in phthalates um, at the right period of time. I'm not, that's not my area, but I've talked to Dr. Manson about it, and there are new techniques to improve. I do think something has to be done about diet. They have to really get at it. And that's not characteristic of every, every other environmental study. A lot of them have socioeconomic status as an issue. Um, and this may too, but it, the, the, I don't know that we're really getting the residual confounding. I haven't seen that as a huge problem in a lot of other studies, but I think here it is because we don't know enough about the characteristics of exposure to phthalates in people. You know, why is it higher in African American women? Why is it, is it the weight thing? Is it the diet, fatty? I mean, again, that's I agree, different. You I agree with you. This this is. Uh, that is the case in the area of phthalate epidemiology, but it is also the case in environmental epidemiology concerning other pollutants. And so that's, that's uh, I'm sorry to press you a little on this point. It is a very important one for our work, as you will understand, and we, we will uh, have to rely on your expert judgment there. So again, the question is or is not the phthalate epidemiology, in your opinion, below scientific standard in other areas of epide uh, environmental epidemiology or not? Uh, no, I think all environmental epidemiology has more difficulties than, say, occupational or cardiovascular. Or in general, environmental epi is more difficult. Doesn't mean, because it's on a standard, a par with all the others, doesn't mean you can jump ahead to draw conclusions just because this is the best there is if it's not good enough to draw a causal inference. Thank you very much. Oh, more? Yes. Can I ask one question? So I, I am familiar with one of the SWAN papers, and I don't remember if it's the three that you, one of the three you listed here, but where she actually um, accounted for the fact that these were chemicals together. So she accounted for the mixture effect in, in some way. Do, do you, are you aware of other studies that have done some approach of, instead of just having tables of, you know, 10 different phthalates, but to try to account for the fact that Yeah, uh, yeah, when they're many of them, like I said, they did try to group them into low and high molecular weight, and they had like a, a global score. She did that and some of the others. Um, not my area, but Dr. Manson disagreed with that strongly because she felt that you shouldn't group them by whether they're low or high molecular weight, but you should group them differently by which ones are most plausibly related because of animal studies. But no, I don't think anyone did that. You're saying a high molecular weight, so it would be out of the class of high molecular weight, 
some way of, of uh, quantitating uh, summary score of exposure. A summary score of all of those together. And the problem you have is if, if one or two of them is not related and the others are, you're going to have dilution and you won't see something that might be there. So she suggested doing it based on animal data, putting them together that way. I, I, would, I would agree with that and I think that in the SWAN paper, I mean, they define the, the low and high molecular weight phthalates differently than I think in one of the just recent presentations where, you know, the, she was using combining diethyl phthalate or, or monoethyl phthalate with monobutyl phthalate. And um, I think as you pointed out, which I agree with, is if you combine the two together, whereas in toxicological studies, the ethyl is not biologically active, but the butyl is, you'll be less likely to find an association in the human study. And then I um, also agree with you in terms of, you know, a single spot measure as being um, not giving you a, a, an exact precise um, estimate of exposure over time because these phthalates have short half-lives. But I think you would agree that if if that's one of the main limitations of the studies, it would make it more difficult on average or in general to find an association, right? So if you did a pregnancy study and you had 10 urine samples over different time points and you can combine them in some way to get what the woman's exposure was during different critical windows or over pregnancy, you'd probably be more likely to find an association if one did exist than if you only use one single measure. I mean, would you agree with that? Well, in order to throw it off, it would have to be like a confounder, so. Um, this, this is well, you're talking about misclassification, so right, is it is, differential yeah. or <coughs> non-differential misclassification is what you're saying. Yes. Um, I think you'd have to try it out and see um, if it's differential with respect to the outcome. I, I mean, I, I mean, I don't know enough of the biology of all this to think it through like that, but that's the way it would have to go. Is it a, a but in general, or, or not? If, but in general, if, you, if two measures is better than one and three better than two, you would think that only having one single urine sample would make it more difficult because of mis your misclassifying exposure. I, I would think you may be right. I'm not sure. I think you'd have to do a validation and say, what would the results be if we had an integrated exposure assessment? Would we have more power maybe? If there's something there to detect it, that may be. And a better measure of exposure. But also with small samples, you can get errors of increase to with just not enough data. So I'm not sure. I think it's, that's, a good, that's a good area for research. What difference would it make if we had a full exposure assessment versus a single spot? Um, I'd have to think about it some more. I don't think, you may be right. I don't know. Okay, thank you. Okay. And Chris, are you going? See if I can do two things at once in the interest of saving some time here. I'm going to try to um, navigate this and get out of this presentation. Um, we're loaded already. I'm just not sure where it is. There we go. Okay. All right. I didn't do so well at multitasking, but I've got it. Uh, got it up now. Um, my name is Chris Borgert. I'm with a small consulting firm in Gainesville, Florida, called Applied Pharmacology and Toxicology Inc. Uh, I've been working with the phthalate esters panel of the American Chemistry Council on cumulative risk approaches for uh, antiandrogens and phthalates. Um, I have to make a disclaimer that uh, while they have heard my views, I'm not sure that they ag agree or disagree with them, but uh, they are my views and, and we will 
publish them as, as they are, uh, irrespective of agreement or disagreement from the funder. Today I want to maybe change pace a little bit, and, and uh, at least with this presentation, and talk about things from a much more theoretical standpoint. Uh, and I've titled my talk, Uncertainty Versus Certainty in Cumulative Risk Assessment of, of, of Antiandrogens. Um, and so I'm going to brush through some, some generalities rather quickly, and you could take exception with them, but um, I'm just trying to sort of orient uh, my comments here. Uh, so to summarize my points, these are the conclusions that I'm driving toward. Uh, the dose additive um, model, um, which is uh, really the basis for, for a hazard index approach, the dose additive cumulative effects have not been demonstrated except at doses near the observable effect range. Now that is um, admittedly a, a limitation of toxicology studies. It's very difficult to show effects. Uh, at, at minuscule doses below the observable effect range, but nonetheless, we have the data we, that we have and, and we don't have other data. Uh, I don't think that dose addition is a generalized phenomenon, um, and by generalized, I mean uh, extending from the first point, I don't think we have the basis for extrapolating dose addition to much lower levels. We simply don't have the data. Another point I want to make that may not seem absolutely related, but I hope to develop it, is that it's not possible to be, to be protective without accuracy. And I think that uh, there is a way to apply a cumulative approach uh, rationally and, and, and in a protective fashion uh, with, with, with an adjustment. And then the adjustment would be what, with what I call a human relevant potency threshold. So I'll try to explain those things during my talk. Now, as a little background, um, Dr. Gray and Dr. Kortenkamp's group have independently reported cumulative effects of anti-androgenic chemicals, which would include drugs, pesticides, phthalate esters, uh, on male reproductive tract malformations, testosterone levels, and other secondary sex characteristics in the rat, and that based on these results, I know that there is discussion of a cumulative risk approach that uses a, a hazard index calculation for anti-androgenic chemicals that affect the male reproductive tract. And I would note, I, I, I think that the, the, the approach is based on a preference, a precautionary preference for the concentration addition or dose addition uh, model of combined action. So that sets the, the, the general uh, framework. But I, I think that we have to admit, and I want to be absolutely clear, these are not criticisms of the studies in any way. They are simply looking at the realities of conducting these kinds of studies in whole animals, and it leads us to, to some uncertainties. And when I talk about uncertainties, I'm not talking about the results obtained by the authors or the conclusions made by the authors. I'm interested in this business of extrapolation because I, as I'll, I'll get to in, in another slide or two, I think that's really what we're talking about here with the cumulative approaches is extrapolating from the observed region to regions where we, we have a much more difficult time uh, doing studies. So both Gray and Kortenkamp evaluated a single mixture ratio of the components. Um, we know that the type of cumulative effect that obser that's observed can f change with different dosing ratios. Again, not a criticism of the study, simply a reality of trying to do these uh, very um, labor-intensive types of experiments in whole animals. It's very challenging to do, say, a full factorial design. Um, both Gray and, Gray and Kortenkamp evaluated scored endpoints. Um, sometimes that makes analysis of the variance a little difficult. And again, I'm talking about the variance that we're talking, uh, that, that would apply to extrapolating the effects. That's what's important here. Um, I'm not going to dwell on these because I'm not sure that, that these are the most important issue. I want to get to some larger issues. Um, there is some discrepancy in the, the types of combined action that Gray found versus the court and count group. Uh, Gray reported that uh, the response addition model did not predict any mixture effects, whereas court and camp generally found that both concentration addition and response addition predicted the mixture effects, but they also found some evidence for synergism. Um, in some instances, scored endpoints were combined, and again, um, I'm interested in, in the variance not only for the study at hand, but that's less important than my interest in variance for extrapolating um, conclusions or, or uh, results that conform with one model or another to very different uh, 
regions of the dose response curve. So I'm working with a statistician, George Casella, another toxicologist, Bob Golden, uh, to understand uncertainties and certainties, and that's what I want to get to a little bit later is the certainties and, and exploring how we might uh, modify a cumulative risk approach with a human relevant potency threshold. So just a background slide to orient everyone to what we're, we're talking about. This is a very, fairly simplistic uh, graphic representation of the difference between these two models, and I would stress that these are simply mathematical models of how one might uh, predict the effects that a mixture would produce. They are not uh, intricately tied to an understanding of biology or pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic models. They're simply uh, two ways of adding. Uh, let's consider a, a hypothetical dose response curve for any toxic effect and doses uh, of chemical A, chemical B, and chemical C present in a mixture at about half their threshold concentration. The dose addition model would, pr would, would use the, uh, would, would predict the response of the doses adjusted for their relative potency added together, whereas the response additive model would, would add simply uh, the responses for each chemical at each dose. And so if these chemicals are present at doses below their threshold, they would give zero effect, and response addition would pre predict zero effect. Dose addition would actually uh, predict a supra threshold uh, effect if these are present at half their threshold concentrations because 0.5 plus 0.5 plus 0.5 would give you a, a, a measurable effect. Um, so this is a bit of the groundwork um, for these various mixture models uh, that, we, that we consider. But I want to make the point that, um, again, irrespective of whether we're talking about a decreasing dose response curve or an increasing dose response curve, the, the critical issue is what happens down here in the very low dose region and distinguishing an observable response from one that's not observable. And that's where, um, that's where our point of departure really is and where I think these, these issues of certainty and uncertainty come into play because we are extrapolating then these models not across a small dose range, but across orders of magnitude many times in, in, um, in some precautionary assumptions that we've, we've long made in uh, cumulative risk assessment. Now I want to switch to a, a different point here for just a minute um, and ask, with that background in mind and our discussion of extrapolate, extrapolating these, these additive models, uh, whether we're really making progress overall in our research uh, and regulatory methods for assessing cumulative risk. It's often been criticized uh, that, that our risk assessment models do not account for mixtures. Uh, but in fact, for decades, uh, a hazard index approach has been used, at least in Superfund style risk assessments, et cetera. And that hazard index approach is based on the target organ of toxicity so that um, single chemicals are assessed for their no observable adverse effect in an animal study. Um, that no observable adverse effect level is then uh, used to derive a reference dose, which usually means reducing that dose by 100, 1,000 or more uh, to, to uh, be protective for human health. And then the, the hazard index approach, say at a hazardous waste site, would compare the expected exposures with the reference dose, add them all up for uh, all the chemicals at a site and determine whether that the entire hazard quotient exceeded one and if it does and one goes back and breaks it out on the, uh, on the basis of the target organ. Well, from that though, um, there is an additional, so, so anyway, first of all, we have assessed mixtures for, for quite a while. We've done it in this uh, somewhat general and more crude way. Um, but there's an interest in being able, again, to, to be more, um, more predictive of what might occur at lower doses and what might occur across species. And so from that uh, interest was generated uh, a desire to look at the mechanism by which chemicals work so that perhaps we could, we could better add a larger group of chemicals based on what we know about their mechanism, not just about what target organ uh, they might affect uh, in, a, in a whole animal study. And so 
we came up with the concept that, that similar modes of action, in other words, chemicals that have uh, what are determined to be certain mechanistic features in common would be um, assessed by a dose additive approach, uh, whereas dissimilar acting chemicals would would actually, and I've got dose addition here, I'll get to that in a minute, but um, dissimilarly active chemicals were assumed to, to behave by response addition. And that led to relative potency approaches such as the toxic equivalency factor approach for dioxins and dibenzofurans. Uh, when that was eventually tested in the last uh, few years, it, the dose addition pro approach works for some cancers, doesn't work for others. For some cancers, even found synergy, and now there's new research on uh, the differences between AH receptors, the aryl hydrocarbon receptor, which is the basis for the TEQ, TEF approach of, of dioxins. Um, there are differences between the rat and the human receptor, so that some of those mechanistic inferences may be in question now. Uh, that was also, this type of approach was also applied to organophosphorus pesticides, and um, the EPA had to do quite a bit of work to demonstrate actual dose addition there. Some then criticized that this was getting uh, too restrictive and too difficult to demonstrate mechanistic similarity, and so now we are where we we are today with the phthalate esters, so, such that dissimilarly acting chemicals may also be dose additive, and, and we we see some demonstrations in the literature from Dr. Kortenkamp and Dr. Gray that chemicals with dissimilar modes of action can also be dose additive, but then I ask you, where is our ability to predict? Because if we are saying mechanism doesn't matter, but only the target organ system, we've sort of taken out of the equation our basis of, on mechanism, which is what we hoped would allow us to extrapolate to lower doses and to other species. So um, it, it's a conundrum that, that, that's difficult to solve. Now, why is that important? Well, we, one of the things we know, and now I'm moving to the level of certainty, we know that single chemicals, at least, are dose dependent in their mechanisms. And this was a publication by Slicker et al. It was actually an ILSI workshop that identified all of the various bases that we know about for dose dependent transitions in mechanisms. I simply ask you then, if we know that the mechanism by which single chemicals operate uh, changes through the dose response range, would not also the interactions or non-interactions or types of additivity also be expected to change uh, across different doses? Uh, some of this is, has been investigated. For instance, a study by Charles et al. It was published in uh, Toxicology and Applied Pharmacology, ask a cumulative risk question with estrogens. They ask, at what dose would synthetic chemical estrogens or putative uh, estrogenic active chemicals be additive in combination with phytoestrogens. So they gave active doses of the phytoestrogen and determined the dose of the synthetic chemical mixture that was necessary to produce an estrogenic response greater than the phytoestrogen alone. Essentially the take home point was those synthetic chemical mixtures uh, increased the estrogenic response over the phytoestrogen background only when each chemical in the mixture was present at about at greater than half its individual Noel in the estrogenic assay. So this is one reason uh, that I think that I'm driving toward this human relevant threshold potency and I think probably the most compelling example uh, for hormonally active agents is when we look at that example, that rather well-known example of diethylstilbestrol. Diethylstilbestrol was widely prescribed to four to five million pregnant women until 1972 in the mistaken belief that it would prevent miscarriage. I say the mistaken belief because there was no properly conducted clinical trial that ever ascertained the efficacy and that ascertained the effective doses. As a result, we had large numbers of males and females exposed in utero to widely different dosing protocols of DES as we all know, it was discontinued in 1972 on the discovery of vaginal adenocarcinoma in the female offspring of the mothers who were administered DES, and male uh, reproductive tract malformations in some of the male offspring. So there were hundreds of clinical studies on DES-exposed men and women continuing forward to today, and what we find is in those uh, widely differing dosing protocols, we find the evidence uh, for a true threshold. In the lower um, dosing uh, 
protocols, we actually see no effects in the DES males, whereas those effects are, are clear in the higher dose protocols, and the same can be said for the vaginal adenocarcinomas. So there's clear indication of a threshold here from human data with a potent estrogen, but I would make the point that those women in the 50s and 60s were also exposed to phytoestrogen that phytoestrogens in their diets, to bisphenol A, to a host of other you know, putative environmental estrogens. And so if all of these things really do add together regardless of their potency and regardless of the amount, we couldn't possibly see this kind of an effect. So what I'm getting at is that we have evidence for uh, cumulative effects, and that could be justified for high-potency chemicals or at doses near the observable effect range. So I'm not taking uh, exception with the, the published data, but I'm simply pointing out that our ability to extrapolate to lower doses, in my view, is unsupportable. I think it's at least questionable and, and somewhat uh, uncertain. And, and here's where I want to point out that I think we need to be careful, and maybe we need to modulate this type of cumulative approach that we take, because overstating the theoretical risks can cause misprioritization and can mask real risks. Now, there are a number of examples of this. One of the most famous was the water disinfection problem in South America when chlorine was removed as a disinfectant and cholera cases resulted. You can think of numerous clinical examples, um, protective uh, doses of, of postmenopausal estrogens given to women turned out not to be so protective, but that was the assumption. Uh, we can think of uh, a day when dietary fats were all considered to be bad, and now many of us are taking uh, fish oil, which is a fat. You know, so it, it wouldn't have been protective and probably wasn't protective to try to eliminate all dietary fat. So we, we've got to have some accuracy in our assessments in order to truly be uh, protective and precautionary. So we're proposing that a human relevant potency threshold can be used to differentiate the point at which the cumulative approach uh, starts to be unsupportable and, um, and would limit the application of the dose addition model, and we believe that this is pretty well demonstrated for DES, uh, and I think that, that the same kind of an approach can be derived from data on human pharmaceuticals. Uh, we're trying to, uh, to forge some some bridges with folks who might be able to help us with that data from the pharmaceutical industry. So uh, with that, I'll conclude and um, ask you if there are questions. Thank you. Questions? Thank you very much for these uh, interesting thoughts. Um, again, I, I, cannot, uh, I cannot disagree with a lot of the things you have said. Just one point for clarification. You seem to suggest that application of dose addition will always lead to the prediction that we will have effects at sub-threshold levels of the individual component. Uh, I think we can very easily reach agreement there that this is not the case. It simply depends on the number of chemicals you combine and really on their level. So, only if the um, the sum of the toxic units reaches a certain level is there an effect to be expected. So if there are any fears that blanket application of dose addition will always lead to prediction of effects, uh, I, I can allay these by saying that's not the case. Would you agree with that? Well, I would agree with that, uh, obviously, but, but, but I don't want to lose my point, is that if dose addition applies, to all potencies and to all levels, then we could not possibly see that clinical threshold. And this was not a few hundred or a few thousand women and their offspring. These were millions of women who were treated with DES. Think about it. They were exposed to all of many of the environmental estrogens and dietary estrogens that we're exposed to today. So if dose addition is applied without any cutoff, then we can't possibly have the result where we have a DES threshold because all of those estrogens would also be adding to the response. And so that's where, where, I'm, where I'm proposing the human relevant potency threshold 
there's got to be a point where we, we, uh, where we uh, decide that a chemical is simply not potent enough to add to the effect or is not present at concentrations near a no observed effect level and so that it would protect us from, <coughs> from um, being, being almost absurd in our prediction that everything will add together because if you think about it, I have, I've published a paper on this in 2003 where we went through all the data on uh, est relative estrogenic potency and as we initiate the endocrine screening program, we're going to identify hundreds, maybe thousands more uh, potential estrogens. And the same may be true for compounds that can interrupt steroidogenesis, compounds that could have many of these antiandrogenic effects. And that kind of butts up with then the idea that they're all adding together. So I, I, I certainly agree with you that the dose addition model uh, when, when applied to any discrete group of chemicals will not always uh, predict an observable effect. But if one were to apply that to all the chemicals that it ostensibly should be applied to, then we come up with a, with a result that doesn't match reality. So that's, that's I think, the distinction. Um, I am really interested in your um, HRPT model, and could you detail for us a little more how you wish to apply this to overcome the usual problems in toxicology, which is demonstrating effects at very low doses, et cetera, et cetera. I haven't quite got this point. I'm sorry. I, I didn't, I'm sorry. I didn't catch the, my, my what approach? I, I, I didn't catch the first Your human term. relevant. Oh, uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. I just, I, I just missed that. I have to forgive my hearing. It's uh, probably a cumulative effect of too much noise over the years. Um, I, I, I haven't got the entire approach worked out yet, uh, certainly for anti-androgens. I would dearly love uh, some data from the pharmaceutical industry. For DES, for estrogens, I think what we would, what we do is we look at the potency of DES relative to 17-beta estradiol since that's the control used in most studies. Uh, I think from those data, I shouldn't have closed out the slides, but I think you can see there, and, 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 and incidentally, uh, this approach was vetted a couple of weeks ago at a, uh, at a conference I attended on uh, validation of alternative toxicological methods and uh, Dan Dietrich from the University of Konstanz in Germany um, uh, seemed to agree with this approach. We're, we're trying to discuss this further with him as well. He presented some of the same conclusions on diethylstilbestrol as Bob Golden has. So we think that, that probably the, the human relevant potency threshold for DES and estrogens can be derived from that human data on those adverse effects, and it's probably within the range. Um, some might say two to five, others might say ten. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's certain, you, we can argue about exactly where that potency threshold is, but I think we have the human data to do it there. With respect to antiandrogens, I think we need more human pharma, pharmaceutical data, and I'm in the process right now of trying to call through the literature for all of that. And uh, that's going to take, I believe, more of a multi-step process because, thankfully, we don't have that kind of mistaken experiment uh, that we had with DES, but it'll, it'll, it'll involve looking for human uh, thresholds with the antiandrogens and then trying to relate those uh, to the potencies of those same antiandrogens in animal studies. Any other questions? And I, I would add one thing. I would just, I've, I've, I've requested uh, data from Dr. Kortenkamp and from Dr. Gray, so we're hoping to work with them. They've been, you know, very, very gracious and, and uh, contacting their, their collaborators. So we're, we're hoping to, you know, come to a, a broad approach that we can all, uh, I mean, that's, that's our research group's goal, and, and we're reaching out to others to do that, and we're, we're, uh, we're thankful that they've been uh, responsive, and we hope that that will work out. Thank you. In deference to those who need a, a caffeine break or a bladder break, we'll take a... Yes? I'm sorry. You have to go? Okay. Okay. We shall proceed.
maybe now all unduly stressed waiting for me here, but sorry about that. Good afternoon, my name is Kathy Clark and I'm here on behalf of the American Chemistry Council to present some information describing exposure estimates uh, to humans to phthalate esters. I'll first begin by providing a brief description of an extensive database the American Chemistry Council has compiled, which includes measured concentrations in the environment and in, in human biological samples. I'll describe two main approaches for estimating human exposure and identify primary sources of exposure for some selected phthalate esters. I'll then uh, present a comparison of human exposure estimates for those phthalate esters. This first slide is just designed to remind everyone, and, and this point has been made already, that there's a wide variation in the physical chemical properties of phthalate esters. I've shown on this plot uh, eight of the more common ones, and it, it represents the number of carbons in the straight chain on the y-axis versus the log octanol water partition coefficient. And the octanol water partition coefficient being a, a representative of solubility in water and uh, partitioning uh, to organic matter and so fate in the environment. And the range for dimethyl phthalate to I, uh, diisodecyl phthalate from one carbon to ten and the log octanol water partition coefficient varies uh, over a factor of 10 to the 8th. So you have a large difference in uh, how these chemicals will behave in the environment, and that affects also their, their selected use. But how they behave in the environment then affects what are the sources of exposure. The ACC has compiled a database, which now includes about 800 references, and it includes 21 phthalate diesters and 25 monoesters. And uh, before any reference is uh, input to the database, it's reviewed and categorized according to data quality. And it includes a review of the analytical and sampling methodologies where contamination precautions implemented, uh, quality assurance and quality control measures where blanks used, where the data corrected for blanks. And a, a very small portion of the data, less than 5%, are categorized as not reliable. And those data are included but are separated from the rest of the data in the database. Uh, the database includes measured concentrations in a wide variety of media, uh, surface water, sediment, soil, indoor air, outdoor air, uh, wastewater, various foods, and as well as human biological samples. There are two main approaches to estimating human exposure, uh, indirect approaches and biomarker approaches. The indirect approaches use the concentration of the phthalate ester in a medium and the intake rate of that medium. Uh, so if you're looking at the exposure due to ingestion of drinking water, it's the concentration in the drinking water times the ingestion rate of the drinking water times an absorption factor divided by the body weight. And this approach is useful in helping to identify the relative importance of different sources of exposure. The other way to estimate exposure is through back calculation uh, with biomarker data. And this uses measurements of phthalate ester metabolites in urine to back calculate exposure to the parent diester. This is a good method for looking at total exposure. It doesn't identify what the sources are, but an another advantage to it is that it has less concerns about contamination issues, which are a prevalent problem when you're looking at the diesters with the indirect approaches. In the literature, there are many studies reporting uh, indirect estimates of exposure, and these studies vary often in the pathways that are considered. Some include only the diet, some include uh, as well environmental media like air or soil, and then others may include exposure to consumer products. Exposure estimates have been made using the concentrations in the ACC database, and they have been made uh, examining the pathways of ingestion of food and drinking water, inhalation of indoor and outdoor air, and incidental ingestion of dust and soil. The estimates have been conducted for five age groups, adults, teens, children, toddlers, and infants. In these next couple of slides, I'm going to present uh, the sources of exposure for a toddler for four selected phthalate esters. On the left is dianbutyl phthalate, and on the right, butyl benzyl phthalate. And for uh, 
both of these phthalate esters diet represents the primary source of exposure, 78% and 68% respectively. Uh, dibutyl phthalate being more volatile and having other uh, sources in indoor air from uh, consumer products and, and personal care products, I indoor air represents 14% of exposure for the toddler and ingested dust uh, a lesser amount, 8%. Soil and ambient air are negligible. Uh, for butyl benzyl phthalate, uh, again, diet is the most important, followed then by ingested dust at 31%, and indoor air is small, only at 1%. This presents now the sources of exposure for diethylhexyl phthalate and diisononyl phthalate. Again, diet being the uh, primary source of exposure and dust being the second largest source. The next few charts present a comparison of indirect and biomarker estimates of exposure. And these estimates are for adults because we have a lot more data, there are many more studies reporting this, but I also have results for the other age groups as well, just less data, and I'll, I'll try to present some toddler numbers as I go along. So the uh, y-axis is median intake of dianbutyl phthalate, uh, ranging from zero to six micrograms per kilogram per day on that scale. And on the left are a variety of indirect studies, and uh, they're from different locations. Some have different pathways, so we, you have, uh, you know, fair variation there from less than a half a microgram per kilogram per day up to a little under five. And then biomarker studies are shown on the right-hand side, and again, you see variation of about a half a microgram per kilogram per day up to uh, a little over four. In general, though, the indirect and biomarker studies, they, they compare within an order of magnitude, and, and as I said, there are specific differences, uh, explanations why there are differences in those studies, which, which I could provide an explanation of. Uh, and in all cases, the, uh, they're less than the reference dose from the US EPA of 100 micrograms per kilogram per day. And the numbers for, for toddler uh, children and toddlers for indirect studies range from about one and a half to three and a half, and for biomarker studies, they're higher, about two and a half to about seven and a half. This shows the same sort of comparison for butyl benzyl phthalate, again for adults, and the uh, intake ranging on the y axis there from zero to 0 0.6. Uh, indirect studies varying from uh, less than 0.1 to 0.5, and biomarker studies from about 0.1 to 0.4. And again, are all less than the reference dose of 200. This shows a comparison for diethylhexyl phthalate, the indirect studies uh, ranging from about two micrograms per kilogram per day up to 11, and for the biomarker studies, uh, about two to uh, a little less than four. And the final one is diisononyl phthalate. Uh, we have far less data for this uh, phthalate ester, and I think it's part of the reason why you see uh, there's more variation here. Um, the indirect studies, the range of the estimates are uh, less than uh, 0.05 up to about 0.65, and for the biomarker studies from about 0.2 to 0.7. And again, they're less than the uh, acceptable daily intake of 120. In summary then, human exposure can be estimated using either indirect or biomarker methods. And the two methods agree with each other within an order of magnitude. And there are uh, many reasons for the differences. They uh, can be attributed to how use of consumer products are accounted for in the exposure estimates. There's a general lack of data on absorption factors and variation in assumptions on absorption um, create some of those differences. There are also regional and temporal differences. Biomarker methods are useful when it's difficult to quantify all the sources of exposure. For example, all the possible use scenarios of different consumer products uh, it makes it difficult to account for that with indirect methods. But the indirect methods are uh, useful for looking at various sources of exposure and comparing uh, the relative importance. 
using either the biomarker indirect method, the exposure estimates are less than the US EPA's reference doses for dianbutyl phthalate, butylbenzyl phthalate, and diethylhexyl phthalate. And for diisononyl phthalate, they're below the uh, ADI. Thank you. Now, does anybody have any questions? Thank you. Questions? Uh, yes, uh, you will have a copy of that. Sorry. In terms of the um, sources for the dietary exposure, is would you know is that from processing, packaging, the inks, and, or or all of the above, yeah. or yeah. Uh, um, Diet's a hard one where it's been difficult to figure out what is the source, and uh, a lot of the dietary study in the database is very old, back from when the phthalates were perhaps used in greater quantity, diethylhexyl phthalate in, in materials that came in contact with, soup, with food, or they're, they're confounded by contamination problems too. That's the other problem with the analysis, that uh, uh, proper lack of use of blanks. So some of those may be biased high as well. Definitely a nice data set re uh, re uh, you presented here. I would also be interested in the other 50% of the general population. So I would be more interested in the distribution of exposures, not only the median exposures. Because I think both from the indirect studies and the biomarker studies, we can learn more about the exposures of the upper percentiles of the general population. I agree with you, and, and we have a draft paper which I believe has been submitted to your committee, and in there I include both uh, estimates of median exposure and 95th percentiles, but so I, I showed that as an upper limit. I was just trying, I was trying to simplify here for the presentation. Of that pa we have that paper. Yeah. Thank you. Mike. And um, I, I have a question for the, the panel, or the, the phthalate esters panel, uh, I'm not sure any one person can answer this, but um, there are, we've heard different numbers, 20, 30 phthalates that are commercial products, um, but we see biomonitoring data and other studies on a, a much smaller number of them. And what I'm wondering is how do we, how do we, the, 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 how does the CHAP prioritize these different uh, phthalates in terms of their importance and why uh, uh, their importance for human exposure and why don't we um, see more of them in biomonitoring studies? Uh, I'm probably not the one to ask. Ray, can you help me out? I'm not sure that um, it's an a question of not seeing them in the biomonitoring studies. I think it's a question of making sure that they are um, evaluated. So if nobody's really looking for some of those, let's call them dogs and cats, um, then there's simply no way to go back and evaluate um, what the exposures might be yeah. other than through the indirect method. Yeah, and I mean, what I'm getting at is, and I, I, I don't expect you to be able to answer it, uh, but something to, to for y you as a group to think about is, uh, you know, we have the, the HPV program in the report that the uh, ACC, I think, sub submitted on behalf of the, the panel, uh, it, you know, lists, has a long list of compounds. A, a long list of phthalates, yet we hear, uh, you know, uh, a lot about DINP, DIDP, DH, DEHP, but there's, I mean, there's a whole long list, linear, linears and branched and so on of any, every size and shape, and, you know, how do we get a handle on which ones of those are, are most important and and how are, how might people be exposed to them? So th I think this is uh, for for next maybe for next time. Okay. 
the data you presented, um, to what year would you fix it that it, it would represent the intake or the exposure? So what would you say would be the most up-to-date exposure estimate? Oh, terms okay. of in terms of indirect approach and direct approach? Um, I tried to make the cutoff to not use data older than 2000 if possible. Um, as far as currency, the, uh, the most current data were from about 2007, I think. So they're within that window. They're, they're not all the same time, but they're fairly close. Does, does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, looking at the last, let's say, if you say for the last set of data it would be 2007 or 2006, how would you take into the account the, let's say, shift or substitution effects within the delayed market? Um. If I can help. <laughs> Please. <laughs> I think... Um, if you look at the CDC data over the course of almost 10 years, um, the the last report came out, what, last year, I think, uh, was the last reporting of phthalates, and there is a minor shift in um, what appears to be a minor shift in the, uh, the amount of lower molecular weight phthalates versus, say, uh, uh, some of the higher ones, or to materials that are not on the CDC's uh, panel. So what would be the year the data of the CDC is based on? I'm sorry? So what would be the, the, the time limit of the, 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 the biomarker data? Well, I think the data were collected as part of uh, the uh, 2007 or 2008 NHANES, and they didn't report it. Um, it took them a while to do all the analyses, so it doesn't get reported until early 2009, I think, in, in blocks of time. So uh, I would say 2007 would be the last real collection. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. If not, we'll uh, go on in the, with our last speaker. Well, I, I think at this point, it's, uh, you probably need to just go on and finish. <laughs> All right, let's see here. For uh, those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Ray David. I'm a toxicologist with BASF Corporation, but I am here on behalf of the uh, phthalate esters panel. And um, I, the last speaker of the day, I, and I'm mindful of the time, so I'll try uh, not to dally. I wanted to talk about um, some of the research that's been done not only by the panel but by others to look at uh, species responses and how different species respond to, uh, to treatment. The reason I'm doing that is because I think as you do your assessments, uh, this, is, this is the kind of information that you will uh, hopefully take into account uh, when you do your assessments. The panel has long been involved in looking at how different species respond at first it was focused on peroxisome proliferation. Uh, the reason we did that is because peroxisome proliferation was the link to liver cancer, which was the, uh, the primary concern at the time. And um, we have since moved to our, or we have also looked at um, responses uh, on the reproductive tract, particularly the uh, testes. Uh, our biggest challenge is looking at how to evaluate developmental effects 
um, in other species, and I'll, I'll give you some examples. We've, we've looked at uh, cells in culture, so hepatocytes, human hepatocytes. We've also looked at primate, non-human primate species to use them as potential surrogates for humans. And what we've learned really is that um, human hepatocytes don't respond the same way as, say, rat hepatocytes, either in culture or in the entire, in the intact animal. And, and these are just a couple of examples of the, of the literature. Uh, the same is true for adult marmosets or cinemalgus monkeys. Um, either of those monkeys um, don't respond the same way, at least in terms of the liver effects, as rats do. Uh, we've, we've tried to, for a long time, we've struggled with that phenomenology, I'll, I'll call it, and try to relate that to what the mode of action is. And, and back in the, in the 90s when uh, PPAR was identified, it gave us a way of really associating the species response with some mode of action, some mechanism. Um, obviously, with some of the more recent information, that debate is rekindled. And uh, you'll hear from people tomorrow about whether or not that uh, is still relative, relevant for the wild type animal or for humans. Um, and by the way, if I can, I, I've been sitting here for a long time listening to the questions and answers, and you'll forgive me, I'm kind of a, a long time student of, uh, of phthalate toxicology. So if I can respond to questions as they came up, I'd like to do that. There was a question about uh, reversibility, recovery of some of the effects. There are actually studies that have looked at the recovery of um, hepatic effects and cancer and non-cancer um, endpoints in rodents that were treated either with DEHP or DIMP. So if that's of information, I mean, that's certainly one of the reports you have already from the last CHAP, and um, the others have been published. So if you are interested in looking at those, we can provide the information. With respect to um, reproductive effects, of course, uh, the, the, uh, the male rat is very sensitive to the effects of uh, some of the phthalates like DEHP and dibutyl. Testicular effects are very obvious, uh, aspermatogenesis, for example. But when we look at other species, we don't see these kinds of effects. Particularly, we've used uh, the marmoset monkey and the cinnamalgus monkey, and here are two uh, three studies in which those adults were treated for a period of time without any evidence of the kinds of testicular effects that we would see in rats. A few years ago, um, we, we did a study with our colleagues in Japan looking at juvenile marmosets. So these were weanlings that were treated with a very high dose of DEHP for a considerable length of time. And again, we didn't see the kinds of testicular effects that we would have seen in a rat. Now, couple this with, um, oh, and by the way, um, this, uh, I, have, I have my scribbles here. There was an, there's another recovery paper, if you're interested. Um, many years ago, and I, I've, I'm sorry, I've forgotten the first author's name. Um, there was a study in which rats were treated with a high dose of DEHP. Um, they were neonates. They were treated for about one week and then allowed to recover. And um, they then followed how well the testicular, um, let's say, the testis function returned to normal. Um, the, the interesting part about the non-human primate studies is that um, we have some evidence that the same kinds of, or, or let's say the lack of response, um, occurs in humans. There are two studies in particular where we know humans were given a particular dose. Uh, the first one was a group from Denmark that smeared volunteers with cream that had dibutyl phthalate in it. And then they looked at hormone levels and they looked at testicular, well, they looked at sperm counts. 
um, and they really couldn't find any kind of an effect on those um, volunteers. There's a, another group that looked at a very small population of neonates that were exposed to DEHP as part of uh, a procedure called ECMO, which uses a tremendous amount of um, PVC tubing, and therefore the dose of DEHP to those neonates was probably the highest that's been estimated for humans. In this small population, they couldn't see any evidence of the kinds of um, genital effects that we might have seen, say, in rodents. Now, again, this, was, this is almost a, a dose and recovery kind of an experiment in a human. Can, can this phenomenology be associated with any kind of mode of action? The answer is no, because for the past 30 or 40 years, we have been trying to understand what the mode of action is for phthalates on the testes. And we really don't have a good answer to that. So what we have is just the phenomenology, the fact that we can test another species and we don't see these responses. For developmental effects, uh, I think uh, Nina already uh, referred to the study by Kevin Guido in which he treated pregnant mice and then looked at the male offspring to see if they had the same kinds of effects that were seen in rats. And the answer was no, not at the same dose level. <clears throat> he, he could not reproduce the kind of testicular agenesis or dysgenesis um, that is observed in rats. He couldn't reproduce it in mice. Uh, we've recently, there was a study in which uh, Richard Sharp's group also treated um, pregnant marmoset monkeys. And again, they could not reproduce the same kind of testicular effects that one might see in, in uh, rats. And yet, there, we have the study from Shana Swan um, that suggests that there is some kind of an association. Uh, how is it that, that we can reconcile that lack of effect where we know there's a treatment and some of the human um, data that, uh, that's being reported? It, it's very difficult to do that, I think. Um, I have a scribble here. One more recovery um, study for you. Uh, there was um, uh, the first author's name is Barlow, um, B-A-R-L-O-W. Uh, uh, he worked with uh, Paul Foster. And um, as a postdoc, they looked at the recovery of animals that had been treated in utero and then allowed to recover. They were looking prim primarily at nipple retention, for example, and, and some of the other sensitive endpoints. So that's, uh, that's another one that you may want to look at. So we, as a, as a group, have been trying to, to um, delve deeper into the issues of developmental toxicity and how is it that we can come up with a system by which we can either screen or we can investigate the mode of action. <clears throat> so we went to some investigators um, in, at Michigan State and um, we asked them to uh, to conduct some studies for us. Uh, they got, uh, there was a pointer here, oh well. Uh, they got some, uh, some cells, um, mouse Leydig cells, that do express testosterone. And, uh, thank you. And um, they, they treated, um, they treated the, the cells with either MEHP or DEHP for up to 48 hours. Um, I, I've just listed some of the effects here, but I, what I wanted to show you was this graph. Uh, someone mentioned to me, why, why am I showing this graph? The reason I'm showing this graph is because the testosterone level goes up with increasing dose of MEHP. That's not, that's not at all what we wanted. It was supposed to go down. So this as a model system obviously wasn't going to work. We've also been working with a group at Brown University that is has working on a technique in which they they transplant tissues from a fetal rat into an adult mouse and from fetal mouse into an adult rat. 
looking at whether or not the fetal tissue responds the same way in a host species, a different species. Um, I, I can't tell you the entire results. Um, I think there's been one paper published from the group so far. It, uh, it does appear that the, the native tissue responds the same way as it would in the intact animal. So the mouse does not show the kind of testicular related effects that would be seen in an intact mouse, even though it's implanted in a rat and vice versa. This group also has a grant, not from us, but they have a grant to look at human tissue from uh, abortuses. And the, preliminary, the data are very preliminary, but it would suggest that maybe humans are along the same, um, same kinds of responders as mice. In other words, they can't seem to find the same kind of testicular related effects. There are a lot of questions here. The kinetics, for example, how robust is the, is the transplant? Um, hopefully, this will lead to a mode of action. At least that's what we're uh, looking for. So what, what I want to ask you is a question about just how appropriate is the rat as the model? If we know that we have these other species that don't seem to respond the same way, and with a rat, we got all kinds of effects, um, is it appropriate to use only the rat? I mean, you are not bound by statute to use the most sensitive animal species. You have the scientific freedom to really adjust your conclusions based on um, the most appropriate species. And I hope that you can do that. And the other question I have for you is, is a bit self-serving. We, I, I work for industry, so we in industry are faced with a situation where we don't have a mode of action for many of these things. So what level of evidence could we provide to you as an example of, of independent um, evaluation group? What level of evidence could we provide to you to demonstrate the lack of an effect in uh, a human. I, I'm not sure I know what that is. Short of determining what the mechanism is in a rodent and demonstrating that that doesn't occur in a human, I, I don't know what else we could do. So uh, perhaps that's something that, uh, that could be discussed over the course of time. Thank you. Thank you. If I could add something to your last statement that makes it a neutral statement as opposed to a biased one. When you declare that you want to find that something isn't relevant, you're indicating a bias. When in fact, we are supposed to be independent and I think it's important to us to find out what are the data that shows either no relevance to humans or relevance to humans. That there's an equal chance that this would be relevant so I don't think we should be looking just under those rocks that might show that it's not relevant. And another, another point, you said that humans and, and mice seem not to react like the rat. And I think that's a very important word, seem. Absolutely. And, and there and are it, all kinds of issues that could make, if we were to look at them, Marmosets and other monkeys and, and mice react similarly to, to rats. And it, it, you know, one, at a simple level, it would seem to me that a comparison, just starting off with in vitro, uh, looking at rat cells and showing that they respond using some endpoint, testosterone synthesis or whatever, and then try to find uh, a, a a mouse line that you could compare it to. That apparently hasn't been done. That, that's correct, it has not been done. And the reason it hasn't, well, that, um, it hasn't been done with mice because, um, and I, my colleague Nina could probably answer that better than I, um, because the, um, those tissues don't seem to retain the same capability for the synthesis. Um, 
once you take them out of the intake. May maybe it's a matter of the combination of cells that uh, the environment that we put them in. Um, the, as as uh, Nina mentioned, there was a, a study uh, by a French group, um, Lambro is the first author's name, and uh, they looked at cultured rat um, cells and they looked at cultured human cells and they got a response sort of with the rat cells and didn't get any with the human cells, uh, at least with respect to testosterone effects. Whether that's convincing enough, um, that's a question you're going to have to, unfortunately, uh, decide. And another issue uh, I think relates to, uh, when I was reading the, the study on, on marmosets, um, they didn't see an effect when they look at the endpoint, but um, assuming there is a mode of action that phthalates are inducing. There must be, yes. There must be, right? Um, then really the critical question is, does the phthalate get to that whatever that's gonna cause the effect? It obviously does in the rats because we're getting an effect. Does it do so in the marmoset monkey? And we don't know that. Um, as far as I can tell from this one study, and you know, I'm, my, I'm not an expert in this area, but just reading that one study, they make no mention of what the target dose is. That's true, they do not. Um, and until you have that, seem has to be the word that you it, use. Um, you're, you are correct that um, how much uh, pharmacokinetics or toxicokinetics um, plays into the lack of response uh, isn't entirely known. Uh, we certainly, uh, there are reports in the literature that talk about um, the blood levels in marmosets relative to um, rats, pregnant marmosets versus pregnant rats. Um, that was that was a kinetic study that, again, we um, we sponsored because to try and answer exactly mm -hmm. that same question. And there is very much a difference in the dose that reaches the target in a rat versus a marmoset, um, at least based on the blood levels. Um, in, in a way that would explain the results? Uh, I'm sorry? You said there's a difference. There is a difference. And is that difference, does it go in a con way consistent with the results? That is, effect in the rats and not in the marmoset. So um, is it lower? It is lower by a factor of, uh, I've forgotten, five or eight, is it? Um, I, I don't know if that is enough of, um, of a difference in the dose um, to account for the lack of response. I bring these, these up because these are the issues that we're gonna have to grapple with and, and, and in the absence of data, it's a well, challenge. And, uh, and I, I, um, I do respect the fact that you will have a lot of information to, uh, to review. Um, if you find that there, there are questions like that, uh, I would encourage you to funnel them through CPSC to the ACC. There may well be information that you simply don't have at your fingertips, okay. and we'd be, we could provide it. Thank you. Andreas. Okay, the mouse may not react in the same way as the rat. Can you suggest a mechanism for these differences? Uh, um, I wish I could, no. Can you suggest a mechanism as to why the marmoset doesn't react in the same way as the rat? No. Okay. Uh, are you suggesting that mouse and marmoset are more like humans than the rat? Um, <laughs> I'm suggesting that a marmoset could be more like a human, yes. Okay. Is there any evidence you would base that statement on which would help us make headway with these comparisons? Well, uh, what kind of evidence would you feel comfortable with? Um, for example, molecular mechanisms, but you, you said already that's not available. I can't give you that, correct. Um, any other evidence you, you want to suggest, really? I mean, I'm at a loss, but you need to help us. I would be very grateful if you could. Um, 
can I give that some thought? And, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> or to, or is at this point the only fact that might suggest more relevance of the marmoset to the human that both both are primates? Is that all? Well, certainly, uh, um, uh, that that is one factor. Yes, that they are both primates. Correct. But at this present point in time, you're not aware of any other uh, additional material evidence. Uh, Maybe Nina is. Rather than offer you direct evidence, I'd just like to refer you to a published manuscript. The lead author is Scott, I believe it was 2009, and that's a really state of the science summary of what's known about fetal steroidogenesis across um, several different species. So that really highlights some research areas, strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. I bring that, just bring that to your attention. Is that <laughs> Hayley Scott? Yes, it is. <laughs> um, and just to be transparent about it, that report was commissioned by, by CEFIC. So that was industry funded, but um, to repeat um, Chris's comments earlier, CEFIC had no input on the conclusions of that study. Um, the idea was to try and generate research ideas for further programs. So, so this, uh, sorry, this uh, uh, Scott et al. report is not published in the peer-reviewed literature. It is. But it's it in is. endocrinology. Okay. Yep. Okay. Right. 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 I think so. Great. Yep. Um, yeah. Where Where is it? I think it's an endocrinology reviews, right? It's like a 20, 30 page paper, yeah. It's very thorough, yeah. Well, not by tomorrow, <laughs> but we can get it. Time for a break. Well, I think one of, can I just, um, I think one of the questions Andreas was asking was one of the slides you were kind of alluding to, I think it was, were two studies in humans, the Janu study where they um, put the cream on Yes. Men, and then also the ECMO study, the neonate study. Yes. Um, as showing no associations with human health endpoints. But those studies, especially the NICU study, where they looked at these children when they were um, young adults or in puberty, was an extremely small study. I think there were 19 Absolutely. Absolutely. children I followed. So I wouldn't, I mean, it was published, but I wouldn't really put any weight on it just because of the small sample size detecting anything would be nearly impossible. I, from a statistical perspective, absolutely, I, I agree with you. And I think I have heard that uh, there have been discussions uh, within FDA about doing a follow-up to a larger population. But as I understand, that is not a simple undertaking. Um, so I guess, uh, the question of priority has, uh, has come up uh, and whether or not that's something that is worthwhile funding. You were uh, <coughs> hinting to species differences and uh, hinting to the fact that the blood levels of the phthalates might be different. Uh, that was the marmoset and the red study by Kessler. And uh, maybe you know that we also have some blood data in the meantime available also for humans. We had a single data set from uh, our study a couple of years ago. But in the meantime, I think also Michael had the honor to be at the Berlin conference and some new data has been presented. And to my recollection, uh, in essence, the outcome was that the human data was more comparable to the red data than the marmoset data. Okay. I think, Rainer, it was an eCPI study. It was the ECPI study dealing with the conversion factors, and it was also confirmed by Johannes Filzer, who independently, together with uh, Fromme, did the same sort of study. But we did the study with 10 individuals, and Johannes had a lower amount of people. Males and 10 females. But again, to make the point, my recollection was that the human data was very much comparable with the red data. 
and not the marmoset data. Is, is this data available for the committee to see? Or? Um, uh, I think Mike Babich was at this closed uh, BFR uh, environmental protection workshop and he has the data. We have probably to, to clarify uh, whether he can get the whole data collection, but uh, I think from our study that will be available once upon a time. Yeah. Just to be clear, the study um, is still in the reporting phase at the moment. Yep. We haven't got a final report available. Um, debated um, extensively amongst ourselves as to whether it would be useful to provide a summary at this point, but frankly, until the data analysis and reporting is complete, I don't think that's that's reasonable to do just yet. But um, given the duration of your of your review, uh, I think it's reasonable to conclude that we should have that available before your deliberations are concluded. I'd certainly appreciate having that. Any other questions, comments? If not, we will we'll take a short break and then the committee will reassemble. Well, thank you to all the presenters. Uh, all right, can we just briefly um, come back to the meeting? Uh, one, two, before we, we quickly adjourn, just to thank everyone again for their presentations and and to encourage you to submit to us any information that you feel will help us in our task. I think that's really, really critical and we really value that. Um, since as you all I think can tell, this is a very difficult um, charge that we've, we've taken upon ourselves and um, we want to walk away from the report being uh, confident that we've done the best job we can. Um, having said that, if there are no comments from the committee, um, I'm going to uh, adjourn this meeting and we'll uh, readjourn tomorrow morning at, I believe it's 8.30. And again, thank you all. <laughs>